Conference with AFRICOM and CENTCOM. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today and for your service to our country. Um, I think many Americans assume that we could move on from two decades of conflict in the Middle East and pivot our attention to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the events of the last six months have proven that assumption wrong. Uh, the October 7th attack on Israel was barbaric. It was the most vile attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Israel has a right to defend itself and has a moral obligation to ensure its people are free from terrorism. That's why we need to continue to provide Israel with security assistance as they seek to defeat Hamas. Uh, make no mistake, Hamas would never have attacked if it wasn't for years of support from Iran. We all know Iran has been a patron of terrorist militia and uh, the main source of instability in the region for over 40 years. But over the last few years, it seems the Ayatollah has become even more emboldened. And this administration's approach is doing little to deter him. In just the last six months, the Ayatollah's terrorist proxies in Yemen have attacked commercial vessels and coalition ships over 50 times, sinking one commercial vessel and killing three crew members aboard another. His IRGC hijacked an oil tanker in international waters and is confiscating the 145,000 metric tons of oil on board. He's okayed the transfer of hundreds of one-way attack drones to fuel Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Now he's entertaining sending Putin ballistic missiles as well. Last week, he oversaw one of Iran's largest naval exercises, this time with dozens of warships from China and Russia. He's increased his stockpile of enriched uranium by 20%, giving him enough material for three nuclear weapons. He's been applying enormous political pressure on Iraq to expel U.S. coalition forces, and he's financed, trained, and equipped terrorist militias that have carried out over 175 attacks on U.S. troops in the region, including the January attack uh, at Tower 22 that took the lives of three American soldiers. The president has responded with airstrikes on terrorist proxies, which have done little to stop them from lobbing missiles at ships in the Red Sea. He's threatened more sanctions on Iran, which have yet to make a dent in the Ayatollah's war machine. Then in January, a terrorist rocket, rockets and drones were raining down on U.S. service members. He sent delegations to Iraq to begin negotiations on reducing U.S. presence. I can't think of a better illustration of appeasing the Ayatollah than that. This administration needs to articulate and employ a real strategy to counter Iran and protect U.S. interests in the region. It appears we may also need a new counter-terrorism strategy in Africa. This weekend, the military junta uh, running Niger announced it was kicking out U.S. forces conducting operations to counter ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the region. This comes on the heels of reports that Niger is negotiating security-related deals with Iran and Russia. It appears Niger will soon join Mali, Libya, Sudan, Mozambique, Burkina Faso in welcoming Russian troops and mercenaries into their country. Meanwhile, Chile is looking to expand its military footprint beyond the PLA naval base in Djibouti. And, they have, and they've set their sights on the West Coast to give the PLA strategic access to the Atlantic. China has already built and is currently operating several large commercial ports along Africa's west coast as a part of its Belt and Road Initiative. Unless the, United, unless the administration steps up, it's only a matter of time before the PLA is operating with impunity off the Atlantic coast. At the end of the day, it is critical for the U.S. to have a footprint on the continent. Even a little goes a long way. The same can be said of U.S. business investments. Africa is, is of vital strategic importance to the United States. We can't let China or Russia become the preferred security or business partner. I look forward to hearing uh, General Langley and Carilla's best military advice on how we can counter Iran, Russia, and China and better protect U.S. interests in their AORs. And with that, I yield to my friend and colleague, the ranking member, for any comments he may have. I thank the chairman for his comments. I thank our witnesses uh, for their, their leadership and support and, and for being here today. We had the Indo-Pacific uh, and uh, the Korean uh, commanders in yesterday. And as I started off that meeting, I'll start off this meeting. This is a global interconnected problem. 
Um, and I think that is the greatest challenge that we face right now. In this region, um, the focus is Iran um, in CENTCOM. But Iran is now increasingly, as the chairman alluded to, working with Russia. Russia is working with China. They're all working with North Korea. There is this consortium that has formed and is working together in a way that we haven't seen. And how do we counter that? How do we rally the rest of the world to recognize the threat that all of these nations pose and to work with us to confront that threat? In the Mideast, certainly it starts with Iran. I, I will disagree with the characterization of the chairman. Uh, the administration and DOD responded forcefully to the attacks um, that happened at Tower 22 and attacked back to the Shia militias in Syria and Iraq. And we're now, I think, on 46, 47 days without any of those attacks having happened. And in part, that's because Iran has been asking them to stand down because of the pressure that was put forward. We did not stand back and do nothing in the face of it. We do need to figure out something about Yemen. And I look forward to hearing from the witnesses because despite our best efforts there, it's been much harder to stop those attacks. And that too is linked with China as China ships are able to sail through the Red Sea unfettered because of their relationship with Iran. Uh, we need to work more to figure out how to reduce Iran's malign influence, but I will point out that that malign influence has been going through multiple administrations in multiple attempts. The maximum pressure campaign under the previous administration did not stop Iran from attacking both Saudi Arabia and the UAE and ships in the Persian Gulf at that point. So we have to come together and figure out a comprehensive strategy to deal with this. It's not going to be a simple solution. And yes, in this region, without question, the war in Gaza right now is the biggest flashpoint. And our support for Israel is important for a lot of reasons, but one is that they are threatened in multiple areas. If this war were to spread to Lebanon, if, the, if Hezbollah felt free to attack from Lebanon, if Iranian proxies in Syria and Iraq felt free to attack Israel from there, we could see this war blow up even further throughout the Middle East. So making sure that Israel has a credible deterrent to those threats is crucial to keeping this war from spreading and growing and causing even more suffering across the region. But also point out that the second the, the October 7th attacks happened, the president responded by surging U.S. troops in the region. Any rumors of negotiating to reduce our presence are just that, rumors. I've asked multiple officials. There is no such plan. In fact, we've done the exact opposite since October 7th, and I believe it's had an impact. It's had an impact on reducing Iran's desire to more directly attack Israel and to more directly attack U.S. interests in the region. So I think that is an incredibly important part of this. The other thing that I do want to point out, humanitarian assistance in Gaza is crucially important. I was just part of a delegation that was in Egypt and Israel. We went up to the Rafah Gate um, to see the efforts at getting humanitarian assistance. We met with Israeli officials. I understand where they are coming from in terms of their concern that any assistance that goes into Gaza so we'll wind up in the hands of Hamas. But that risk is worth taking versus the risk of the humanitarian catastrophe that is happening in Gaza right now. We have got to work with Israel to get more humanitarian assistance in to reduce the human suffering that is present there. Now, just a few days ago, for the first time, Israel allowed uh, aid to come in uh, from a different gate from further up north, which is helpful, but we have to continue that pressure. The effort to try to get aid in from the Mediterranean is also a positive step. But I hope that anyone who supports Israel understands that the suffering in Gaza right now is a huge threat, not just to the people in Gaza, but to Israel itself. We need to find an effort, we need to, to lead an effort to reduce that. Africa is a huge challenge. I look forward to General Langley you know, walking through some of the challenges there. But I do want to dispel the notion that somehow the U.S. should just come in by brute force and push out China and Russia from having influence in Africa. A, that's not going to happen. B, it would be incredibly unwise to do it. Russia and China are global powers. They are going to be present. What we have to make sure is that we maintain our presence. And in that, in that region, it is all about partnerships and alliances. And this has been frayed without question. There has been a lot of instability throughout West Africa, certainly in Libya as well. But we do have partners in the region. I'd be interested to hear from General Langley the partnerships that are most important and most positive and how we work going forward um, to strengthen and build on those partnerships. But again, I want to make clear, 
I don't think it would be a wise idea for the U.S. to view Africa as, you know, some sort of, you know, chip in a broader game that we have to go in and force our influence on above all else. We have to be able to balance that with the interests of the nation in the region and work with them to make sure that we reduce the malign influence of Russia and China in what is going to be a competitive environment. So I think this is an incredibly important hearing. I thank our witnesses. I look forward to their testimony and uh, to the questions and answers. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member. Without objection, the chair may declare the committee in recess at any point. No objections are ordered. Um, I'd now like to introduce our witnesses. Uh, the Honorable Celeste Wallander is the Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for International Security Affairs. Uh, General Eric Carrilla is the Commander, United States Central Command. And General Michael Langley is the Commander, United States Africa Command. Welcome to our witnesses. Dr. Wallander, uh, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Rogers, uh, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the House Armed Services Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify on our defense posture and policy in the U.S. Central Command, U.S. CENTCOM, and U.S. Africa Command, U.S. A AFRICOM areas of responsibility, alongside Commanders General Carrilla and General Langley. The world has significantly changed since our posture testimony in 2023. The crises proliferating in both the U.S. CENTCOM and U.S. AFRICOM AORs have created a level of instability not seen in years. Although the Department of Defense finds itself operating in a dynamic environment, the 2022 National Defense Strategy, the NDS, is still our guiding light for how the DOD will operate in the world. DOD applies principles of partnership, deterrence, diplomacy, integration, and values as it works to strengthen integrated deterrence, reduce conflict, and promote stability. A strong, principled, adaptive U.S. military remains a central pillar for U.S. leadership in the world while supporting a stable and open international system. First and foremost, we support diplomacy as our preferred means to achieve our objectives. Second, sustainable security relies on expanding regional security constructs, alliances, and partnerships, and integrating our partners with one another as well as the United States. Respect for fundamental freedoms and human rights expands sustainability in our security partnerships. As we take decisive action to address threats and challenges today in the U.S. AFRICOM and U.S. CENTCOM AORs, we continue to stand with our partners and allies to win what we view as the competition of coalitions that is becoming increasingly critical to our common security. In both regions, we closely monitor efforts by the PRC to expand its military footprint through its overseas logistics and basing infrastructure to project and sustain military power further. In the CENTCOM AOR, a prosperous, peaceful, integrated Middle East supports the long-term security and prosperity of the United States. Unfortunately, the Middle East faces several crises. Hamas brutally killed 1,200 Israelis on October 7th and continues to hold some 130 American and Israeli hostages. We are alarmed at the significant loss of life throughout the conflict, which followed. Israel has an obligation to protect civilians and uphold international and international humanitarian law. Malign actors across the region, chief among them Iran, cynically exploit events unfolding in Gaza. Iran-backed militia groups attacked U.S. and partner forces over 175 times since October 17th throughout the region, killing three U.S. service members at Tower 22 in Northeast Jordan. A U.S. contractor died of a heart attack, and over 180 service members sustained injuries during these attacks. In the Red Sea, the Houthis seek to affect this vital channel for global trade with at least 50 attacks against commercial shipping and naval vessels. We mourn those we have lost. Our prayers are with their families, always. Amid these crises, the Department of Defense is rising to the occasion to defend the nation's values and interests across the region. Significant U.S. assistance to Israel aims at ensuring that what happened on October 7th can never be repeated. The United States unequivocally stands for the protection of civilian lives during armed conflict consistent with the war, law of war. We continue to underscore with Israel and regional counterparts, both publicly and privately, the importance of obligations related to civilian harm mitigation and risks of conflict to civilians during Israel's operations against Hamas. We closely monitor the situation in Lebanon to Israel's north. 
We continue working to contain the conflict while deterring state and non-state actors seeking to escalate tensions. DOD continues to hold Iran and its proxies accountable for their attacks on U.S. and coalition forces. We do not seek conflict in the Middle East, but attacks on American forces will not be tolerated, and we remain postured and prepared to use all means necessary to prevent a nuclear-armed Iran while working to counter Iran's destabilizing activities. On the AFRICOM AOR, Africa is not merely important, it is essential. African partnerships are critical for the Department of Defense to maintain its technological edge, accomplish its geopolitical and strategic objectives, and power our futures. In, despite Africa's boundless potential, threats such as political instability, democratic backsliding, and the presence of violent extremist organizations are the focus of DOD efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the committee for inviting us today. Thank you, Ms. Wallander. Uh, General Carrillo, you're recognized. Uh, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, on behalf of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and Guardians who serve this command and our nation, I welcome the opportunity to talk to you today. I recently returned from my 27th trip to the Central Region. As I sat here just a year ago, the region was on the verge of improbable, unprecedented, and transformative progress. Today, the Central Region faces its most volatile security situation in the past half century. This is not the same Central Region as last year. The events of 7 October not only permanently changed Israel and Gaza, they created the conditions for malign actors to sow instability throughout the region and beyond. Iran exploited what they saw as a once-in-a-generation opportunity to reshape the Middle East to their advantage. Iran has worked for decades to encircle the region with its proxies, and in the past six months, we have seen every proxy in the Iranian threat network operationalized in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, the West Bank, and Yemen. Iran's expansive network of proxies is equipped with advanced, sophisticated weaponry and threatens some of the most vital terrain in the world with global and U.S. implications. Houthi attacks on our warships and international shipping coupled with Iranian-aligned militias attacks on our forces in Iraq and Syria are a direct result of an Iranian threat that has been incrementally spreading. Violent extremist organizations have also seized on this opportunity. ISIS surged their attacks in Iraq and Syria earlier this year, and the risk of attack emanating from Afghanistan is increasing. I assess ISIS Khorasan retains the capability and the will to attack U.S. and Western interests abroad in as little as six months with little to no warning. Strategic competition has also continued to evolve across the region. China and Russia have been quick to capitalize on destabilizing influences. They have shown meager interest or capability to reduce regional tensions, but they have also increased their efforts to compete with the U.S. and pressurize regional partners across all elements of national power. Collectively, Iran, Russia, and China are strengthening their relationships and fostering a chaotic landscape favorable to their exploitation. Iran continues to sell 90 percent of its oil to China, funding Tehran's subversive and malign activities across the region. And Iran has developed a production pipeline for supplying weapons to Russia, fueling the war on, on Ukraine. The ramifications of this partnership have global implications. The convergence of crisis and competition makes the CENTCOM area of responsibility the most likely region to produce threats against the U.S. homeland, trigger a regional conflict, and derail the national defense strategy. The CENTCOM region also remains critical to the world's energy supply and remains essential to the flow of global commerce. U.S. CENTCOM provides strategic depth to our defense of the homeland and security is at risk if we cede this space to Iran, terrorism, and China. Iran knows that its decade-long vision cannot be realized if the countries in the region continue to expand integration with each other and deepen their partnership with the United States. Our partners in the Levant, the Arabian Gulf, Central and South Asia are committed to advancing the region, and the United States remains their partner of choice for now. U.S. Central Command's strategic approach of people, partners, and innovation reinforces the vision of an integrated central region and supports the whole of government effort to secure regional and global interests. Our people are the bedrock of everything we do. 
We are laser focused on optimizing their talents and highlighting their character and competence to our partners. Our strategic advantage remains our strong military to military partnerships, while our adversaries and competitors rely on parasitic transactional relationships. We also innovate with our partners, developing approaches, concept, and technologies to address the threats we face, protecting our forces, and creating depth in our force posture. These efforts have saved lives. We are clear-eyed about the task before us. The shockwaves of the past year continue to reverberate globally. Our service members are standing the watch side by side with our regional partners right now. They operate in harm's way every day, whether at a small outpost fighting in Syria fighting ISIS or a destroyer knocking down a barrage of ballistic and cruise missiles fired by Iranian backed Houthis, and they do so with honor and courage. Five of our teammates gave the last full measure of devotion as they lived out the oath we swear protecting the freedoms we cherish. They represent the very best of us. It is the honor of my professional life to serve as their commander, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Carrilla. General Langley, you're recognized. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished committee members, it's an honor to appear before you today representing the outstanding service members, civilians, and families of United States Africa Command. I'm proud to testify with my friends, ASD Wallander and General Carrilla. Joining me today is my command senior enlisted leader, Sergeant Major Michael Woods. He is at the heart of AFRICOM's efforts to help African partners professionalize their enlisted and NCO forces. I'm also joined by my USAID advisor, minister, counselor, Mrs. Mara Barry Boyle, and my State Department foreign policy advisor, Mr. Phil Nelson. They represent AFRICOM's whole of government team and integrated approach to Africa. Now in the last year, thanks to your authorities, resourcing and support, AFRICOM's all-star team responded to numerous crises and conflicts across the continent. I'm honored and proud to serve among them. Now today's global events ranging from the Russian Federation's war in the Ukraine to the Houthis attacks in the Red Sea directly impact the lives of millions of Africans. Terrorism, poverty, food insecurity, climate change, and mass migration shatter African lives. These factors sow the seeds of violent extremism and Russian exploitation across the entire regions of the continent. We're seeing these, uh, these impacts as these threats unfold in this year. Challenges to democratic governance and, and order continue to occur across the Sahel, complicating our relations with key partners. However, working closely with our interagency partners, we continue to engage on the continent in order to safeguard U.S. interests and advance our campaign. Africa's campaign revolves around central themes of ensuring strategic access, countering threats to the homeland and U.S. interests, and preparing for and responding to crisis, and lastly, bolstering our allies and partners. Now, this campaign places our African partners at the center, achieving positive change by executing African-led but U.S.-enabled operations, all focused on our shared objectives. In today's dynamic environment, our whole of government partners require appropriate resourcing. I strongly advocate for our State Department and USAID partners to receive the resources they need to guarantee our combined success. Now in Africa, modest investments and resources go a long way towards advancing our national security interests. Now Africa faces many challenges, but offers even more opportunities. With our African partners at the forefront, reinforced by our efforts and the efforts of our allies, we will continue to gain ground towards achieving lasting security, stability, and prosperity on this crucial continent. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, General. Thank all of you, and uh, recognize myself for questions. General Carrilla, have the recent conflicts in the Middle East done anything to strengthen the par partnership between uh, Iran, Russia, and China? And if so, what does that mean for, for our security? Uh, Chairman, thank you. Um, I am very concerned about the, this renewed or this new relationship between Russia, China, and Iran. 
Um, what we see is Iran is reliant on China and Russia is reliant on Iran. Iran sells 90 percent of its oil, all U.S. sanctioned, to China. So in effect, China is funding Iran's subversive and malign behavior in the region. Iran went from hundreds to now thousands of one-way attack, unmanned aerial systems, suicide drones that they are providing to Russia. They were providing them both complete systems and they've built a factory for Russia to now produce them themselves, still relying on a supply chain. And they are now doing over 100 one-way attack drones a week in Ukraine. What I can talk in a classified setting is what Russia can provide in, in return back to Iran, which is concerning. We're also seeing China, which gets 50 percent of its oil from the Middle East. Um, what they are doing in the Middle East to advance their, their uh, um, elements of national power, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. General Langley, how concerned uh, should we be about China and Russia's growing footprint in Africa? Chairman, we should be extremely concerned. Uh, as I would say, that uh, both are very much exploitative when possible, but they are also coercive when necessary. They're trying to get what they want. They're trying to replace the West and, uh, moreover, the United States in our access and influence across this crucial continent. We're seeing this through this misinformation campaign. It's very influential, and it really is across the Sahel. But there are other regions that, uh, for geopolitical regions or social economic regions, uh, or even military, in which uh, the Russian Federation offers across the Sahel in exchange for mining concessions. So, Chairman, we should really be concerned. We need to get our act together, collective as a whole government, our information campaign. Thank you. Ms. Wallander, uh, the administration's strategy for dealing with Iran, obviously, and containing Iran, obviously isn't working. What can we expect to be done differently that might yield some results? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, containing Iran requires uh, whole of government uh, focus, which entails sanctions, diplomatic work in the UN and with uh, global partners who similarly are concerned and affected by Iran's destabilizing uh, efforts and activities, which we have seen uh, yield some fruit with uh, global uh, participation in Operation Prosperity Guardian uh, to defend against Houthi, Iran enabled uh, Houthi attacks against shipping and also the EU mission, uh, Espides. So it is bringing the international community in, which sees a clear harm to their interests, but then it is also focusing on building the capabilities and the security partnerships in the region, uh, which has focused on uh, Gulf countries and which was uh, advancing quite successfully under General Kurilas and CENTCOM's leadership until the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel, not by accident. Uh, Iran s saw that uh, approach, which was bringing in partners, building capacity, creating in integrated defensive capabilities as a threat to their freedom of action. And so we need to continue to work with those partners because Iran will be constrained by the capabilities and the good work of our partners in the region. Thank you. Chair, I recognize the ranking member for any questions he may have. Thank you. Following up on that point, the, the current dynamic is not to our advantage, as you described, as Iran has been you know, building the partnerships with Russia and been getting a little bit of a free pass in this. The way to shift that dynamic is to get back to the Saudi Arabia-Israel peace agreement uh, with the U.S. as well. If, in fact, we were able to get back to a place where Saudi Arabia, UAE, Israel, and the U.S. were a leading partnership against Iranian influence, I think that would improve things. But Walk us through how that would improve things and, and what the path back to that type of partnership is. And that's for both General Carilla and Do Dr. Wallander. Um, uh, thank you, um, Congressman Smith. I think that uh, the first, uh, re the first uh, aspect of getting back to that partnership is working with countries in the region to find uh, a long-term solution uh, to the plight of the Palestinian people, which means getting on the path, back on the path of a two-state solution, the creation of a capable, stable, responsible Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. That will 
create uh, the diplomatic space to get back to discussions with Saudi Arabia and other Gulf partners. And on tor that towards that end, if I may, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, and let me be clear, I mean, is the reason Israel does, they are threatened on multiple sides. And, and there are too many people around them that have never accepted their right to exist as a country. And they're, they're trying to figure out how do they survive in that very complicated world. How do we convince them that one of the ways they survive is to embrace the idea of self-governance for the Palestinian people? Well, the first and foremost, the, in order to embrace that possibility, the people of Israel need to feel secure. Absolutely. And so first and foremost is uh, the uh, defeat of Hamas and the creation of permissive security conditions in which Israel uh, can then look towards that longer future. Those aspects are interactive, and we work, we talk with our Israeli partners every day about the importance of civilian harm mitigation and avoiding civilian harm, not only on the moral merits, and not only because it's consistent with international law, but because it's in Israel's interest to create yeah. that, that diplomatic. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little tight on time. I have one question for General Langley. I don't want to get General Carrillo a chance to respond as well. Go ahead. One of my Arab partners tell me is just that, that there has to be a viable process to a, and a path to a two-state solution is where they would see um, being able to come back to the table on some type of normalization. Yeah, thank you. And General Langley, one of the worst wars and worst humanitarian crises is going on right now that, that nobody's really talking about, and that's the war in Sudan. Um, can you talk to us a little, is there any prospect of that, of that war slowing down, coming to an end? What is our role in working with partners in the region? Uh, because that is a humanitarian crisis that quite, quite frankly rivals Gaza right now, and, and nobody seems to be discussing it. What, what should we be doing about it? What, what is the future? Ranking member, uh, Sudan is still in the consequence right now of Burhan and Humedi, and as they back in uh, 15 April of 2023 was was a problem. I know that we've engaged whole of government uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the State Department going in and in Jeddah and trying to get uh, those parties together to solve it. But it, it hasn't worked. Uh, so we're still keeping uh, uh, engagements uh, globally, uh, whereas other uh, uh, leaders are going. But I'll just tell you, so especially the RSF, Hemeti, his forces are, are backed by some, uh, 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 I'll just say, uh, egregious uh, members on the globe that are uh, pushing for their own uh, great power uh, competition uh, goals uh, in that country for access. And I'm talking about the Russian Federation. They would love a warm water port. They love to have the the, the, the port uh, there in in Sudan uh, as as their own. That's against our global uh, campaign plans. I can uh, talk with a higher level of specificity in closed session, but that is a concern. Okay, thank you. And just quickly, General Krilla, Afghanistan. There's interesting. You know, Pakistan is becoming more concerned about the Taliban. You know, what are the potential for partnerships there to try to help us keep an eye on the Taliban and ISIS and whatever else is going on in Afghanistan? And I apologize, you've got 25 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Congressman, so I, I literally talked to the chief of the Army staff from Pakistan this morning in a regular scheduled call. Um, they have tremendous insight into the violent extremist organizations inside of uh, Afghanistan. And I think there is tremendous opportunity to be able to partner with Pakistan on that. Great. Thank you. That's what I want to yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank each of you for your service. Uh, I really would like to begin today by paying tribute to the three uh, Army Reservists from Georgia who were killed just seven weeks ago, murdered by uh, Hezbollah, uh, a puppet of Iran. Uh, and uh, you've already recognized Tower 22. And, uh, but three young people uh, who should be remembered, Kennedy Sanders, William Rivers, and Brianna Moffitt, uh, they were killed. Uh, and additionally, there were a number of uh, troops who were injured. And uh, Madam Secretary, I uh, have sent a letter to Secretary Austin for an accounting of how many were injured. Uh, what are the conditions? Uh, the American people need to know this because the uh, puppets of Iran uh, have every intent to fulfill their goal of death to Israel, death to America. I also want to point out that it is bipartisan, and I agree with the ranking member, that we have global interconnectivity. Uh, the interconnectivity is a war we did not choose, and that is dictators with rule of gun invading democracies with rule of law. It began on August 22nd, uh, 2022, uh, February uh, 22nd, 
2022 with uh, war criminal Putin uh, invading Ukraine. Then October 7th, the puppets of Iran invading uh, Israel. And I, I think, sadly, much of this relates to the weakness that was shown uh, of the appeasement by Mr. Biden uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, 13 uh, young Marines killed uh, at uh, Abbey Gate. Uh, and then I was really grateful this week with General Mark Milley and General Frank uh, McKenzie. Uh, it was clearly identified that the decision to abandon Afghanistan was solely by Mr. Biden. Um, Mr. Biden, on August 26, uh, 2021, blamed the military, uh, said he had letters. Uh, that's not accurate. Uh, and indeed, it was his decision which has led to the weakness around the world and the, uh, the incredible uh, uh, situations of uh, instability all over the world. With that in mind, uh, Dr. Uh, Secretary, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the retaliatory strikes of American forces carried out on targets in Iraq and Syria after the attack on Tower 22. It's been reported that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard instructors returned home to Iran once America announced the warning of our incoming strikes. Madam Secretary, the purpose of the retaliatory strikes should be to hold Iran and their puppets accountable for the act of violence, de-escalate the threat they pose, and defer further attacks on U.S. service members and our allied partners. But giving notice, uh, to me, is utterly irresponsible, and it actually underscores weakness. What is the purpose of giving notice? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, the, uh, my understanding is the notice that was given is to our Iraqi partners. Um, who we owe uh, that as um, as part of our partnership, as part of our strong relationship, um, and uh, as a matter of respecting their sovereignty. Well, I, I just find it totally irresponsible, and, and really it relates also uh, back again uh, to uh, the Houthi attacks, over 150 uh, on American personnel in the past couple of months, and uh, there's been really no response. Uh, and what, they should be alerted uh, we know trajectory today. Uh, we knew trajectory 150 years ago, where the launch sites were. They should be notified now that there would be an immediate response and not given notice. And uh, th this is just so irresponsible. Equally, uh, to me, uh, uh, General uh, Carilla, uh, it's uh, shocking to me that we have Iranian oil exports uh, which are being used to finance the killing of Americans around the world. Uh, are there any sanctions to stop these um, exports? All of the Iranian oil is sanctioned right now, Congressman. And uh, it's sanctioned. Are there waivers? What, how, how does this occur, uh, that there would be sales to uh, China, to the Chinese Communist Party? Let's get real. Uh, and then uh, additionally, we have uh, incredible and unfortunate and uh, irresponsible sales and exports from uh, war criminal Putin to uh, the world's largest democracy, India, which is inexcusable. And so what, what uh, are, are the sanctions being waived? They're, they're not being waived, Congressman. What's happening is Iran is evading those sanctions by using an entire ghost fleet called a dark fleet of ships to be able to go out and do ship-to-ship -ship transfers and using other methods to bypass those to get the oil where 90 percent of it goes to China. And, and, and I appreciate you say China. It's the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and they have every intent of world domination, and we should be making every intent to protect the American people and Western civilization. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, Dr. Wallander, uh, on February 13th, the U.S. Senate voted 78 to 22 to approve a national security package, which, uh, among other things, included help for Israel to replenish its Iron Dome uh, uh, program. Uh, funding for Ukraine and funding for humanitarian assistance. When we talk about uh, Iran's malign behavior, uh, I think one of the most obvious manifestations is the fact that they've now become a major weapons supplier to Russia in the war in, in Ukraine. And actually one of the reasons why Ukraine is in such desperate straits right now is because of the torrent of drones that, um, again, are being used by Russian forces um, to weaken the, the front line. Can, can you just, again, for a moment, just reiterate about why the U.S. House now has had five weeks to, to take up the Senate passed package and why it's so desperately important? And it has a spillover effect um, into CENTCOM uh, in terms of trying to get that measure through. 
Thank you, Congressman. Yes, one of the global aspects to uh, the challenges that the United States and DOD in particular face is that there is this relationship between Russia and Iran, and they are enabling one another's uh, development of new technologies, adaptations of tactics, of, of the use especially of UAVs, but also the capabilities on the battlefield, and so we are in a competition with stay, helping our partners stay ahead of both the technical capabilities, the platforms, and uh, adapting to the, the, uh, the growing cooperation between Russia and Iran on tactics. And we have long warned that the relationship between Russia and Iran, which is, which is enabling Russia in Ukraine, is threatening our partners in the region, and we are seeing that with the ability that the Houthis have to threaten and actually attack shipping among other capabilities uh, that threaten our partners in the region. Thank you. I mean, again, it's blindingly obvious if you know people um, are sincere about trying to stop the malign influence of Iran, we should pass this supplemental package tonight uh, and get it to the president's desk. Um, General um, uh, Perilla, uh, a few weeks ago, the U.S. Army vessel uh, General Frank Besson departed Virginia uh, to the Mediterranean, where they're now setting up a, a sea uh, pathway to get humanitarian assistance uh, into to Gaza. Can you talk a little bit about just what steps are being taken to ensure safe transport and um, you know how this whole, whole peer construction pro process is going to take place? I think it's an extraordinary um, effort. It's not a, a substitute for land um, you know, access for humanitarian assistance, but again, I think it's a great example of the, of the Army stepping up. Sure, Congressman. What it is is it's a, um, a joint logistics over the shore. It's coming out of the 7th Transportation Brigade Expeditionary. Um, when I commanded the 82nd Airborne Division, it was one of my subordinate units. And what they're going to do is set up a floating pier out at sea and then a trident pier, which basically comes off of the beach to be able to transition humanitarian aid from um, Cyprus out to the floating pier and then take it by these Army watercraft onto the pier and then push it into a marshalling yard and then for onward distribution. Um, right now, the uh, five of the ships have departed and the large, uh, um, the large medium speed roll-on, roll-off, the Benavides, was actually supposed to depart at 1000 this morning. It finished loading up about three this morning and that'll be heading across and all of that should be arriving in the theater in the first couple of weeks of uh, April. In terms of safety, you know, for the crew and also Who's going to be at the receiving end when this is actually makes it to the beach? Can you talk about that? Yeah, force protection is one of my top priorities. And right now, my deputy commander and much of my staff is currently in the region in multiple countries as they work out the fine details of this. Thank you. And again, Dr. Wallander, the humanitarian um, component of the security package, again, is a global humanitarian assistance. Uh, I mean, obviously, Gaza is in dire need for, for, for assistance, but also it's in General Langley's sphere as well in terms of the Sudan as far as getting humanitarian assistance into that region. And can you talk about how that helps us in terms of U.S. presence and a, and a you know, a positive uh, posture? Well, we have a moral imperative as well, but, but yes, there is a strategic element of this, which is that it, to lay the groundwork for a peaceful resolution, once Israel has uh, defeated Hamas, we need to be sure that we have the relationship and we have supported the civilians, uh, the people of Gaza who require that humanitarian assistance, and same element, the, the value proposition in Sudan of the United States being there has to be supported by Congress. I thank the gentleman. Chair, now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Carilla, and thank you all for being here today. General, you spoke eloquently about Iran using its proxies in your AOR. Many of us believe that Iran will continue to use its proxies to attack us, our allies, and our friends, unless and until we take direct and forceful action against Iran. There are many ways that this could take place. I have no prescription on what that should look like. Shouldn't we be more forceful against Iran directly? Congressman, thank you for the question. As the combatant commander, I provide options. Um, those include everything from cyber to kinetic and identify the risks associated with those options. And then the policymakers and the president make a decision on which options to choose. I would tell you that when we look at actions that we have taken, for instance, in Iraq and Syria, um, on our last strike that we did, uh, we hit 85 targets. We killed the commander of Kataib Hezbollah. 
who is responsible for all uh, um, Kitab Hezbollah inside of Syria. We killed Abu Taqwa, the head of Harakat al Nujiba, one of the Iranian Lime militia group's operational commanders. Um, and what that did is that caused them to pause, and a, a period of deterrence has been established in Iraq and Syria. And we're on day 46 right now, but I would tell you all deterrence is temporal. Um, but I do believe there has to be cost imposition on Iran for them to be able to cease their malign behavior. Well, thank you. And I hope, uh, uh, Dr. Or Secretary Wallander, that you take a message back to the White House that we need to show more backbone against Iran. I'm going to shift gears here, General Carrilla, and ask you about directed energy and with the engagements that are coming against the Houthi attacks. Um, many are arguing, and I would agree, that we are on the wrong side of the cost curve and that the cost per shot is unsustainable. Uh, and what's even more important is that we're depleting precision munitions that may be needed in the future for another fight or for, our, for ourselves somehow. So what is the utility of directed energy and why aren't we doing more to use what we do have, I know it's not perfected yet, but it has great capabilities against drones and things like that currently. Why aren't we doing more in the Red Sea? It, it does, Congressman, and, and what we also need to look at, not just directed energy, is high-powered microwave mm -hmm. to be able to go after drone swarms. We do have, I just, the Army is losing its transformation and contact. They've given us three 50-kilowatt lasers that are striker-based that we have inside of Iraq right now. We are experimenting with those and the best and most effective way to use those to help them learn from that to be able to make better systems. I encourage the Navy to employ uh, directed energy systems. I know there is at least one destroyer, uh, the Preble, I believe, that has a 60 kilowatt Helios. Um, we would welcome being able to bring systems in, but directed energy is not the panacea. Um, it'll be part of a layered defense, and we have to be able to get further out with it uh, to be able to bring down these systems when it's only costing a dollar a shot, minus the acquisition, um, to be able to do that. But I would tell you what's worse than shooting a million dollar missile at a $20,000 drone is that $20,000 drone hitting a $2 billion ship with 300 sailors on it. Um, and I think our Navy is performing marvelously right now. Well, I think I have to agree with everything that you've just said. Uh, please lean on the Navy to use the Preble and uh, we can continue to make advances in what we learn operationally uh, under the strain of these attacks, under the stress of the attacks. So I appreciate uh, what you're doing, and um, uh, I would ask that you really use more of directed energy and high-powered microwaves, uh, because we, there's a capability there that we've been testing, but not really using operationally, and we need to start doing that. I'd hate to see a repeat of Tower 22, for instance. Yeah, Congressman, what I tell all the services, give me systems, we will experiment with it. We'll tell you if it works in a real live environment. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, just sort of off topic here, but uh, it's been talked about the uh, pullout from Afghanistan. It would be good for all of us to review the total history and time frame for the pullout from Afghanistan, recognizing that the previous administration set a specific date in early March to be out of Afghanistan. The Biden administration extended that by over six months. So uh, moving on, my question really goes to uh, General Langley uh, and the work that you're doing in Africa. Uh, that is specific interest to me since my wife and I were Peace Corps volunteers there many, many years ago. Um, you speak of the whole of government. Please describe in as much detail as possible what you mean by the whole of government and use uh, the example of the whole of government in the eastern part of Africa. What is it, what is necessary, and then how the military would participate in that. Congressman, thanks for that question. As we are in a competition uh, environment at uh, the strategic level, we compete with uh, PRC and, and Russia and their offerings of offering uh, the bright shining objects, if you will, uh, to our African partners. But collectively with our whole government approach, 
uh, with USAID and State Department and what they bring to, uh, together. When we do the, AFCOM, uh, the Africa campaign plan of OAIs, which are the operations, activities, and investments, a good portion of that is across the interagency. So as far as assurance actions, I would just say, give you a, a good example of the uh, President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed in Somalia, as his operations were going in the Haran region, he used his clearing forces that we trained to be able to achieve objectives. And then by happenstance, USAID, as a result of the floods and desertification and the drought, came in and provided. Those clans out there in the central region of Somalia turned. That was how the playbook actually works the whole of government. That's a, just a clear example. I have m numerous examples down in the southern piece of Africa as well, uh, time permitting. So it's a combination of USAID and the State Department. Is there, are there sufficient resources for those two entities to meet the goals of your operational plan? Congressman, no, there isn't. What State Department does and what uh, USAID does, just the way the, the budgets are structured, they don't have much flexibility outside of humanitarian assistance. They need to have the flexibility to take uh, these budgets and reorient money at the time and the point of consequence. If they had that, we would really be more effective in, the Af in, the, in our campaign plans. I, th I think it's important for the committee, we tend to focus on the military piece of this. Is it true that the military piece of the Africa strategies to success, the military is small compared to the other whole of government participants? It is, Congressman. You know, but with modest investment, we're getting asymmetric uh, synergistic effects with our asymmetric approach of being able to uh, codify all of the activities and investments uh, across the interagency and, and across the departments uh, to metastasize into uh, a whole uh, a whole of government effects, desired effects uh, that protect U.S. interests and also uh, protect the homeland. Aside from the Wagner Group, are the militaries of China and Russia directly involved in Africa? Yes, Congressman, I'll start with the most pressing and immediate acute threat right now across the Sahel. Uh, I would say some of the activities, uh, layered threats that we have across the Sahel are actually fueled by the Russian Federation. And I say this because uh, given the demise of beginning Pogosian, we thought that the, uh, the Wagner Group was going to demise in, in, uh, on, on the continent, but it's gone in another direction because now they're sponsored by uh, the uh, MOD of the Russian Federation. That's a concern. And I would note that the migration from that Sahil is a major challenge for our allies in, uh, in Europe as well as in the northern African countries. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much, General. I thank the gentleman, Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. General Carrillo, I want to begin with you. I was just a few short years ago, the Army says, hey, we're getting rid of our watercraft. We're divesting. Guess what? Today, the 7th Transportation Brigade out of Joint uh, Base Langley Eustis is spinning up. Guess where they're going? To Gaza. Joint logistics over the shore. They're going to be there. Sounds like to me there's a little bit of contradiction there. Anyway, very difficult mission. It'll take them a little over, well, a little less than a month to get there. Once they're in CENTCOM, I think they're going to be at extraordinary risk because they're going to be targeted. Hamas, the Houthis, Iran-backed terrorist groups in the region. I think there's going to be extraordinary risk with them focusing on that job. First question, how are you going to protect those forces? How are you going to make sure that they are not in the headlines, unfortunately, weeks after by being targeted by those groups. How are they going to do their job while they're looking over their shoulder? How, how is that going to happen? I want to know what the long-term plan is for that. Second of all is how do you sustain protecting that pier? So once it's constructed, then all of a sudden you have to look at it and say, well, it's great to have that pier to, to have the logistics. How do you protect that in, in the long run? So how do you protect now, and then how do you protect in the future? Congressman, force protection is a top priority for this. My deputy commander, like I said, is already in the region working with our regional partners over there. In a classified setting, I can talk to you specifically about the force protection measures that will be there and with our partners as well. 
You know, they're going to be under continual operations there. So once the pier is constructed, they're going to be offloading. Uh, we know as we speak today, Army personnel, Navy personnel, civilian personnel working 24 hours a day at the Port of Virginia to put together the necessary pieces to be able to go there into theater and to be able to construct this infrastructure. It's interesting to me that we say that there are going to be no boots on the ground in Gaza. Can you tell me how you physically make that happen? Because my understanding is a pier actually connects to shore. There will be some construction activities on shore. Tell me, are, are personnel going to levitate? How, how are they not going to go from the water to the shore and have boots on the ground in Gaza? Again, Congressman, like I said, I, I used to command. The, they used to be one of my subordinate units. I'm very familiar with how the uh, 7th Transportation and Joint Logistics over the shore does this. Um, we are working with our partners in the region that will assist with this, and I can talk to you in a classified setting exactly how this will operate. So you're very confident there'll be no U.S. personnel with boots on the ground there? There is no plan to put boots on the ground. Okay. We look at this in, in the longer term. Obviously, this is going to be at risk in that, in that particular area. Give me a little more uh, idea about what the cost will be for us to continue to, to protect that facility. What's going to happen? We're going to have civilian ships there coming in with cargo. Obviously, they're, they're going to be targets. What, what's the plan not just to protect the facility there on shore, but what's the plan to protect the civilian ships that come in and offload that cargo? There will be protection for them, Congressman, that I can talk about in a classified setting and tell you exactly how that'll work. And, and, and you're confident that we will be able to protect against all, all threats? Force protection is a top priority for me, Congressman. Gotcha. Very good. Uh, General Carrilla, I know that uh, you talked about um, uh, the threats posed by the Houthi in the Red Sea. You know, we see a number of different assets that they're, that they're putting uh, in our direction, whether it's drones, loitering, loitering munitions. Uh, I understand the effort to have to protect our men and women on those ships, to protect our assets. But is it a sustainable long-term strategy to use million-dollar munitions to shoot down drones and loitering munitions that are ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 apiece? Congressman, what's worse than that is that twenty thousand dollars. I, I understand. I didn't, I didn't, didn't ask you today. Listen, I, I'm not questioning at all whether we should protect our sailors, our soldiers, our Marines, our airmen, and our Coast Guardsmen. Top job. Is it sustainable to continue to use those costly munitions against the price of these threats? What we need is for Iran to quit supplying the Houthis. I know. I, I, I listen. You're, 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 you're great at talking around the question. My question is: Is it sustainable? Is it sustainable to use that level of weaponry against the level of weaponry that's if, being if used If we can degrade them? that capability on ground where they're shooting it from, it can be. And what we need is the services to create more cost-effective where it has the same probability of kill on these munitions. I welcome directed energy. I welcome high-powered microwaves. So, so you'd be fully in favor of the Army doing everything they can to get into the counter UAS business? I am all about counter UAS, and if we pass the supplemental, there's $686 million for counter UAS in that, which will save lives. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, the chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Quick fact check. Um, General Langley, uh, just quickly, uh, there's a historic relationship with the then USSR and the African countries uh, that sustained itself in terms of their equipment supply. So wouldn't you say that that foundation has, is historic in nature as well. Just a simple it, yes or no. Yes, it is historic. Yeah. Well, thank you. So to say this all occurred in the last two years isn't factual. Secondly, uh, Dr. Walliner, uh, is Iraq important to us as a, as a linchpin to our ability to provide security uh, and economic benefit uh, in the Middle East? Iraq is uh, absolutely vital to the ability to ensure the enduring feat of ISIS. So, so us conducting uh, a military strike on Iraq, on their sovereign territory, without telling them, would have been endangering that to some degree. So it was good that we notified Iraq? Uh, we, are, uh, we are in Iraq uh, at the agreement of the Iraqi government. All right, thank you. I just want to deal with that. We've talked here, and it's one of the most critical things, uh, underpinnings, about this relationship with Iran, Russia, China, how, you know, that is so, uh, so much of an issue. It's one of our greatest threats going forward. 
We have a better coalition. One of our biggest difference makers is the coalition that we have in, in Ukraine alone, over 50 countries all working together. Uh, and that comes from, dates back to the World War II days where we came back to the greatest period of, of prosperity and peace that we've had uh, with sacrifices like 400,000 Americans who died, including my own uncle, killed in action. What do you think that coalition is thinking when we sit here? This is like, well, uh, you know, uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the theater? We're sitting here about to go home for two weeks tomorrow, going into April. We still have not acted on a security package that's vital. People on the front line in Ukraine are dying right now because this Congress hasn't acted. So what message does that give to our coalition? Congressman, there is concern in Europe and uh, in the Middle East about uh, the way forward for American support. Um, and I would just emphasize as well that it's very clear that Russia uh, in particular thinks that it can outweigh us because of our inability to provide security assistance and, to and vital what, partners. What message does this give to our enemies? What was China thinking as this occurs right here in this Congress? These are important issues we're talking about. But presently, right now, today, we have to act. What message is this giving to those countries that were worried about, Iran, Russia, China, uh, about our inability to just do what we're supposed to do, which we pledge to do, provide aid to these allies. We have done our best to reassure them with words, but they are waiting to see our actions. And so we sit here today and try and pin blame around things. There's 185 Democrats who signed a discharge position on that security package. That was a huge bipartisan package by the Senate. Bipartisan. It does happen around here. And I know for a fact, just looking at press accounts and talking to people, there's easily over 100 members, I think more, on the Republican side. That's about 300 members right here in this Congress willing to pass that package today. One person's holding that up, the Speaker of this House. He has the ability to put that on the floor for a vote today. So as we go around here, you admit you can see my frustration. As we go around here, ready to go home and nitpick and the important issues, these other things, we're abrogating our own responsibility to a far greater degree than any of these other issues. Yet we sit here and bring our military here and try and nitpick issues to get political advantage when we're not doing our own job. I can't tell you how angry that makes me, how disappointed that makes me and how I think it affects our security far greater than anything I've ever seen in the over decade I've been here. So I just ask my colleagues, and I demand of the speaker, put that on the floor before we go home and do the right thing. I yield back. General from Massachusetts yields back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I don't pretend to speak for every Republican, but generally speaking, I think the majority of us uh, believe that Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan are three separate issues, and it should be three separate votes. We do not like having multiple issues tied into the same piece of legislation uh, with regard, and I think that all three would pass if they were individually put to the floor. There are a couple of things that we've asked for in the Ukraine vote. We have asked for the enforcement of sanctions. The fact of the matter is, President Biden's refusal to enforce the sanctions that were put in place against Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin have allowed the Kremlin to become one of the most cash-rich countries on the face of the earth right now. And as much as I dislike Putin, he's used that cash to rebuild his military industrial complex. Uh, and, and he's been very effective with what he's used that cash for. for. So we've asked for the enforcement of the sanctions. We have asked for the U.S. aid to, become, to come primarily in the way of weapons. We have asked for a seizure of the Russian assets, which I understand while the Biden administration would agree with us on, maybe some of our NATO partners don't agree with us on, we'll deal with that. Uh, and we've asked for the Biden administration to fulfill our commitment to our NATO and treaty partners where we told them if you broke your dependency on Russia for energy, that we would supply energy to you. And what did the Biden administration do? 
after, after our NATO partners spent billions of dollars to, to increase the capacity to import LNG and other energy from the U.S., the Biden administration canceled it. So that's what we've asked for. Four things as Republicans in the U Ukrainian age package. Basically just doing what it takes to win. And so that's what we've asked for. Uh, I'll move to you, General Langley. I want to talk, I want to talk about Africa. I want to talk specifically about Niger. The U.S. has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in that country, invested in that country. Less than a year ago, it was one of our strongest partners. Uh, we are now being, uh, as I understand it from the open source reporting, pushed out of the country, and they have uh, turned towards Russia. Uh, can you just outline for me how this partnership fell apart so fast? I mean, so fast, and then how was the Russian military ab able to so quickly become, if you will, Niger's apparently partner of choice now? And, f and it's baffling to me that we just totally missed this from the standpoint of our intelligence community. Um, how, wh what indicators were there that we missed? Congressman, uh, thanks for your question, and also thank you for getting down onto the continent and uh, even going into Niger and looking uh, uh, at some of their uh, members of their government and look at them in the face and assess uh, where they were in their democracy. Well, I would say just in answer to the question is holistic. Uh, as we saw, uh, the dominoes fall. When I did my assessment, I said, yeah, uh, across the Sahel, all these countries are at a tipping point. Uh, Mali had already fell. Burkina Faso, as I took command, had already fell and uh, sat there uh, 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 over a year ago, uh, over there at the, uh, the Gaylord, where we had the 30th anniversary of the SPP. And uh, one of the general officers from Niger, as we're sitting there with uh, uh, General Lyles from Indiana, said, uh, we are an island of stability in a sea of chaos. You can depend on us. So I would say, uh, what, was, what actually stoked that, the drivers of I, that's what I laid out on the uh, regional disinformation campaign. Uh, the Russian Federation uh, had their playbook. They had their passing game uh, through their disinformation uh, campaign. Years ago, seven years ago, you only had about 200 uh, folks across the continent of Africa that were on the Internet. Now there's 600 million. Very compelling across the civil society, but moreover, very, very compelling in their militaries right now, driving uh, uh, in putting a wedge between what we teach, law of armed conflict, uh, civilian-led governance, I think is failing because it's being drowned out. And that's where I ask for more capabilities in the State Department, in their, in their uh, Global Engagement Center, and also in our information operations uh, in the military. So, so the number that you gave, approximately three times the number of people that are engaged in social media in the United States are engaged in social media in Africa. I watched... I watched as the Russians, it was Wagner Group at the time, but Russians, whatever, they're one and the same, right? Um, French ISR picked up a mass grave in Mali, I believe it was, and before the French were able to convince the government of Mali or share the intel with them that what Wagner had done, Wagner had used social media to convince the public that it was the French that had done it. Is that... Is that Am I correct in that? That's how savvy they are, uh, uh, Congressman. Uh, very savvy, and uh, we need to step up our game as far as uh, being able to reveal uh, what their activities are in the disinformation. Gentlemen's time I agree expired. Chair, now recognize the gentleman General. from California, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, both. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Last month, I went uh, to Israel in the West Bank. I saw firsthand the devastation this war has caused for both Israelis and Palestinians. I went to the site of the Nova Music Festival where over 250 civilians were murdered. I also saw the violence against Palestinians by settlers in the West Bank. I have said time and time again, protecting innocent Palestinians and rooting Hamas out of Gaza are not incompatible goals. Secretary Wallander, can you speak to why it is important for this region that we find a solution that ends this conflict and how Congress can help support these efforts. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, the, the first and foremost, of course, the United States uh, supports Israel's right to defend itself. 
um, and we agree that our, the events of October 7th must never, um, there must be no chance that that ever recurs. Uh, but how Israel conducts its, its operations is absolutely vital to Israel's long-term security and security and stability more generally in the region. And uh, Secretary Austin uh, and all of the administration leadership are clear with the Israeli counterparts on that, offer our assistance, offer actually US military experience on conducting military op operations while maintaining uh, those high standards. Thank you. I appreciate the work being done balancing diplomacy while securing U.S. interests and supporting partners and allies in two very complex AORs. General Langley, good to see you here again. I saw you last in Africa on one of my trips there. Addressing violent extremists has been a significant challenge in Africa. Now that you have served as the commander of AFRICOM, for over a year and a half, what other strategies should we be focusing on that have been, not been widely explored, either due to funding constraints or other limitations to fight insurg insurgency groups in the AOR? Congressman, uh, first of all, I thank you for your visit uh, to the continent as you uh, went there to assess and uh, look at their whole of governments. Uh, uh, acts such as the Global Fragility Act should be working. Uh, and their retort is, uh, yes, we want it in, uh, in more capacity so it can work like a, uh, what they're concerned, Africa's Marshall Plan. I think just the enduring defeat of honest extremist organizations is building out uh, these fragile governance uh, and uh, their capability to fight. Uh, so it's not just a military solution. Uh, it, is a, it is a whole of government by, by these countries to be able to affect some, some uh, uh, strengthening measures in development of their democracies. That is the enduring solution. That is the panacea to violent extremist organizations because as, it, as that ideology, false ideology, came down through the Maghreb, they grasped onto it. But we're talking about the Fulani tribes. We're talking about the sheep herders. And, and also we're, we're also talking about the farmers. Conflict. So all those layer threats is causing that problem. And so it's a false caliphate in which that it can be interdicted, intervened by good governance and uh, democratic norms. Thank you. General Carrilla. Since October 2023, Iranian-backed militias have launched approximately 100 attacks on U.S. forces in Syria. Can you speak to what you are doing to detour Iran and its proxies from becoming more emboldened, especially with Russia and China's growing influence in the region? How do, you, how do our allies help, help you here? So we have a partnership with our partners inside of Syria that we work with in the enduring defeat of ISIS. And the same thing with our Iraqi security forces that we work inside of Iraq for the enduring defeat of ISIS as well. Specifically to the attacks inside of Syria, we continue to bolster our defenses. Our counter UAS, the supplemental, has 686 million of it for counter UAS um, if that is passed. Um, specifically, though, we have responded to uh, attacks inside of Syria and inside of Iraq with the most recent attack. And we're on about day 46 right now of a temporary deterrence. I have no illusions that this will be enduring because we do think that they will try and attack again in the future. Thank you, General. I'm out of time. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from California. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins. And thank you, Chairman. Uh, because we got a lecture on the $100 billion supplement that hasn't been passed, I, I got to agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Scott from Georgia, that if we would break these things up, uh, they might get legs. Uh, Dr. Wallander, in this $100 billion supplement, which our government's very good at writing big checks without really explaining where it all goes, my understanding was $65 billion went to Ukraine. How much of that is actually for military uh, equipment? Uh, Congressman, uh, I, I believe a I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. That was, yeah, that's that the point. That, that, $65 billion is a big number. Uh, Admiral Aquilino just yesterday was talking about a $10 billion shortfall in unfunded mandates that we need for the China-Taiwan, and I would argue that China is a greater threat, immediate threat to us than Russia. So if we would break these things down, we can actually look at the numbers. It'd be a little easier for Congress to pass and explain to constituents back home uh, where this money's going when we're having so many issues here at home, can't secure our own border, et cetera. But that's not why we're here today. Um, General Carilla, it's been over five months since uh, Hamas attacked uh, Israel. 
On October 7th and 6th, Americans remain alive among the hostages, supposedly in Hamas captivity, uh, while two have died. Can you elaborate here about what efforts are being made to bring these Americans home? Yeah, unfortunately, Congressman, it's five Americans that are left alive right now with the death of one announced, uh, I think, two weeks ago. Um, in a classified setting, I can talk to you exactly what we're doing. Okay. Well, we just don't want to forget about that, and I know you haven't. Uh, how much operational control does Iran exercise over its proxy forces? And I ask this because do you lend any credibility to the recent reports of the fissures between Iran and its proxies, as well as among the proxies themselves, and what does that mean for uh, Iran's regional escalation? I would say Iran has tremendous control over its proxies, particularly in Iraq, Syria, and uh, Lebanon. Okay. What steps could the Biden administration and or Congress take right now to exploit the, the fissures, if you didn't really comment on that, and uh, strengthen deterrence against the Iran-led escalation? Well, Iran must be compelled to cease their malign behavior and their actions of directing, supplying, funding, and training these proxies. So do we have plans to interdict that? Are they in place? So that's when we, if we're specifically talking about like the Houthis, for instance, um, that is one of the lines of effort. We want to deny their ability to be resupplied. That'll take a whole of government, actually an international effort, much like we did with counter piracy, um, to be able to go after that, because only two ships can, res uh, can resupply the vast majority of the equipment that we've destroyed so far of the Houthis. Yeah, I mean, they certainly seem undeterred at this point. And uh, 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 Mr. Whitman brought up, or maybe Mr. Lamborn brought up the fact that uh, how do we get at these to deter them? You said that if we could go at the sources, uh, you know, we, we could stop using very expensive uh, interdiction methods. Uh, or why are we not going after them? So I'll tell you, the, 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 to restore freedom of navigation in the Red Sea, which is our campaign going on right now in the Red Sea, it's five efforts. The first one is to protect the shipping, that's Prosperity Guardian. The other is to degrade their offensive capability Third is to deny Iran's uh, ability to resupply, which we see and we try and interdict. Unfortunately, we lost Special Operations 1 Chambers and Special Operations 2 Ingram, uh, both SEALs in that interdiction when we got medium-range ballistic missiles and, and, and anti-ship cruise missiles. We have to stop that. We have to increase the international effort to be able to do the inspections on the vessels that are going into Hudaydah. We need to isolate the Houthis in the information environment, and we have to impose costs on Iran so that there is consequence to their behavior. And certainly it's not just an American problem. Where are our partners in the fight? What accounts for more allies and partners not joining the coalition? So we have 24 partners in the Operation Prosperity Guardian. 17 of them are public. There is also an EU mission just this very morning, about six hours ago. Um, our French partners shot down two anti-ship ballistic missiles. Our German partners shot an uh, unmanned surface vessel um, in, col in collaboration with the, uh, the Eisenhower, and we destroyed an uh, unmanned surface vessel as well. Our partners are out there. They are protecting ships, and there are some that are partnering with us on the offensive actions inside of Yemen. Okay, let me just finish with this. What, what steps is the department taking to resume the uh, pre-October 7th progress on Israel's military integration with the U.S. regional partners, particularly building on its integration into CENTCOM and the breakthroughs of the Abraham Accord? So we work with, I, my job is on the military to military level. We work with all of our partners in the region. Part of that, we have several um, efforts that we do, everything from integrated air and missile defense, um, cyber security, maritime security. We do that in these forums that bring these efforts together. I think there's a diplomatic effort on the um, Abraham Accords. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member. Sorry to belabor the Ukraine thing, but I just want to point out, in six months we haven't had a vote on Ukraine supplemental in the House on any, in any shape, manner, or form. So if you all got a different way to do it, I know there's some who oppose it, and if you oppose it, God bless you, Mr. Gates. Yes, I respect that. Um, but if you actually support Ukraine, you haven't put a vote on, on in any form, one way or the other. S divide it up, this amount, that amount, the other amount. You haven't given the House a vote. And now Ukraine is hanging on by their fingernails. And the only vehicle that we have that can pass is the one the Senate passed. So if you got something else, A, I wish you'd given it to us months ago, but B, any day, Anytime, put something on the floor to give us the opportunity to at least have a vote to, to support Ukraine. Keep, well, we could do this. We could do that. Well, what if we did it this way? What if we did it that way? That's a fascinating conversation, why the Ukrainians are dying and why Putin continues to think he's going to be able to take Ukraine. Give us a vote on something. 
to help Ukraine. And the final point on the 60 plus billion dollars, I'm gonna get the numbers slightly off here, but well over 30 billion of that money is to go to restock US munitions. It's going to us. That's the overwhelming majority of it. I believe the humanitarian portion is less than 10. I'm gonna be slightly off on that, but I see nodding heads out there from people who know. So, so those aren't, but whatever your excuse is, and I've heard every single excuse going back to six months ago when I had a meeting with Kevin McCarthy and Jake Sullivan and others, and Kevin was speculating about, well, we could do this, we could do that. What if we did it this way? What if we did it that way? And I said at the time, wonderful, just do it. You know, will the ranking member yield for 10 it. seconds? I, I will, and I'm sorry, I just, I just want to try to find some way to get it done, because I, I know there are a lot of Republicans that do want to get it done. So I'm not, I just matter. want to point out there's a fourth thing. I did want to point out there was a $14 billion Israeli bill brought to the floor that failed a couple months ago, standalone. Yeah, I'm talking Ukraine for the moment, okay? Ukraine. So, anyway, I yield back. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's welcome. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Slotkin. Thank you, and I uh, firmly agree with the ranking member. Just bring us whatever you want, but bring it forward. They don't need talking points. They need artillery and air defenses. Um, okay, um, General Krilla, it's good to see you. Um, you are one of the most decorated officers we have in service now. I was looking through your service record Panama, Desert Storm, Haiti, Kosovo, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan. You were um, uh, uh, seriously wounded in Mosul in 2004 um, and won the Bronze Star there. Um, um, help us understand in Gaza, you know, you're engaging with your Israeli counterparts, the military strategy on Rafah and the military strategy for the next day. Um, we struggled with this as a country. The United States struggled with counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. You were wounded in Mosul, and we were back in Mosul, taking it back from ISIS in 2017. Um, what, in your understanding, is the military strategy for Rafah, and do you support that strategy? Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. You know, my relationship with them is military to military. I do not advise them on the actual day-to-day yep. uh, -day operations. Um, I do talk to the Israeli uh, chief of defense on a routine basis. And what is your understanding of the plan? So what I would tell you what uh, Israel's overarching plan, what they have told me in terms of just Gaza, is they want to go in after a lot of the leadership and destroy the strategic tunnels that are in there. Strategic tunnels as defined by those that have command and control and the ability to manufacture weapons right. so that they can't use those again. And what I would tell you, when you look at the, the leadership that's in there, there's five brigades inside of Gaza, North Gaza City, Central, Khan Yunus, and Rafa. In underneath those, there are battalions. And there's also specialized battalions, much like we have a UAV units or et cetera, um, that they have. They're going after the leadership of those to do that. What I do know is what they've told me is they are not gonna take action until they have the ability to protect the civilians and move them out of the area. I don't think they have finalized the plan for that until they do it. I am not aware of their current plans to be able to do the civilian harm mitigation for Rafa. They are still- Have you asked them? I have asked them. They are finalizing that, and they've said they will provide that to me when, uh, when they are complete with it. And when you were serving in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, especially as battalion commanders, et cetera, what were your responsibilities around humanitarian aid? And making, and, and did you, Give me your sort of responsibilities as a military leader around civilian harm reduction and getting humanitarian aid to those areas where you served. So at, at one point I was the commander of all of Western Mosul um, as a battalion commander and we wanted to make sure we took care of the civilians that were underneath our sector um, of Western Mosul while also going after uh, the elements that we were trying to fight. So you worked to facilitate humanitarian aid into those areas, even as you searched and effectively hunted down Al-Qaeda and others. That is accurate, Congresswoman. Okay, and do you feel like the Israelis are doing everything in their power to maintain as low as possible civilian harm? I in think, your military estimation. I, I think they are very conscious of the civilian harm. We talk about it every time I talk to my counterpart, we talk about that. Um, what I am trying to do, though, is help alleviate some of the human suffering there, and that's coming either through, we, we just did an airborne operation of aid this morning. We've approached now almost a million meals in the north with eight other countries. We're also working to increase the land um, line of communication to bring some in. There has been some progress in the last two weeks. I talked to Ambassador Satterfield, who is the uh, special representative 
for humanitarian efforts, and he is seeing some progress on the challenge is internal security and distribution inside of Gaza. And that is effort. There, there is some progress being made. We just had a conference in Rome with USAID and others on how the distribution will work when eventually we get the maritime domain as well. What's your understanding given, the, again, the United States, we struggled with this so much in Iraq and Afghanistan, the end game, the day after planning. Um, the fact that you were injured in 2004 and we were still in Mosul and we were still dealing with Mosul in 2017 and beyond. Um, what's your understanding uh, of the military end game for Gaza? I think they're still working that, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, I yield back. Thank you, gentlelady chair. And I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Gallagher. I'd like to follow up on that, maybe attempt to simplify it. I mean, we are fortunate to live in a democracy. And Dr. Wallander, would you say that the United States military in general holds itself to the highest ethical standards, moral and ethical standards? Yes, Congressman. Would you say that our military takes great effort to avoid civilian, civilian casualties wherever possible? Yes, Congressman. Do you believe the United States intentionally targets civilians? I believe the, United, the U.S. military does not intentionally target civilians. And in, in Israel, uh, we have a vibrant democracy as well. This is a great thing. Um, do you believe that the Israeli Defense Forces hold themselves to a high moral and ethical standard just as the United States does? I do believe that the Israeli Defense Forces hold themselves to that high standard. And Israel does not target civilians and take steps to avoid civilian, civilian casualties wherever possible, correct? I, I believe that is a true statement, sir. And is there any evidence at present that they are, you emphasize in your testimony that they have a responsibility to protect civilians. I, I agree. I, I think they're doing, uh, to going to great lengths to do just that um, and to uphold international law. Is there any evidence that they're violating international law? I am not aware of any evidence that they are deliberately targeting civilians. And so contrast that, the, uh, the high moral and ethical standards of the United States military and our allies in Israel uh, with uh, Hamas. Uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization, correct? Yes, Congressman. And Hamas does not care about human life, including the civilians in Gaza, correct? Uh, worse, Hamas exploits others' concern for civilian life by placing their capabilities and their fighters uh, protected by human shields. That was going to be my next question. You anticipated the use of uh, human shields. And many civilians in Gaza have died from Hamas rockets landing inside Gaza and Hamas's attacks on civilians, correct? Uh, I believe there have been such uh, validated incidents, yes, Congressman. The thing I'm, I'm curious about is Hamas could, uh, if, if we apply the same standard, uh, they have a responsibility to protect human life. Uh, Hamas could surrender today, released all of the hostages, and the war presumably would be over, correct? If Hamas ended their uh, war against Israel, the conflict could be over today. Uh, a final question on this front. Do you want Hamas to be removed from control of Gaza, or would you like to see Hamas regain control of Gaza at the risk of another October 7th type massacre? The massacre. administration fully supports uh, Israel's goal of destroying Hamas's ability to conduct these operations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, General, um, talk to me a little bit about uh, how, do you, how do you characterize the relationship between Iran Russia and China. I know the, the expanded uh, influence and presence of China in the CENTCOM AOR is of particular concern for you. Try, help, help me understand the connections between these, these three entities. Um, so if I could go, Congressman, to just China and Iran, what we are seeing, Iran is selling 90% of its oil, and that is the largest part of their GDP is oil, is, go, is being purchased by China. It's all sanctioned oil um, by the U.S., so Iran is dependent upon China. In effect, China is funding their subversive behavior throughout the region, their malign and subversive behavior. The relationship between Iran and Russia, um, that really started when they asked for them to provide the one-way attack UASs, specifically the Shahed 136. They started providing complete systems and they built an actual factory in Russia. And those same Shahed 136s, a very capable system, are now going at a rate of over 100 a week mm. from Russia into, uh, into Ukraine. And then the, what I'll talk in a classified setting is the concerns of what Russia can provide back to Iran. And we're actually seeing interest of China interested in purchasing some of Iranian UAVs as well. So it's not interdependent, but it is a cooperation that is happening between all of them. What do you think China's goals are in the region, in the CENTCOM AOR? They want to be, they want to be able to replace the U.S. As, the, um, as one of the dominant forces in the Middle East. And you, you mentioned our strategic advantage being our close partnership with our allies, whereas in contrast to our, our adversaries, they have far more transactional relationship. How do you think 
the CCP views uh, Iran in the region as a, as a client state, as a, a source of hydrocarbons that it can I think control? it's a source of hydrocarbons like they do many of the other countries. 50% of their energy comes from the Middle East. They import about 70% of their energy. I appreciate that. I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman. Jerry, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, ma'am, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate this opportunity. Uh, focusing on Niger, clearly we bet big. Okay, we bet big on Niger. And right now we're, in, uh, we're at a point in which we either want to double down or we want to fold, unfortunately. And look, I get the bet. As I called it in my visits there, it was the Alamo in an area that I've also now called an uh, area of deja coups, seems to be happening often. But now we're dealing in Niger with a military junta, a military junta that is basically kicking out our partners. It kicked out France, it revoked a security pact with the EU, and now, unfortunately, the regional security coalitions in that area, ECOWAS, ACRA, G5, let's be frank, they lack strength, they lack credibility. And then after the meeting that you were at, General Langley, Langley with Assistant Secretary Fee, soon after, they kicked, they ended the security pact with the United States, unfortunately, or at least that's their intention at this point. And I appreciate the direct and frank conversations that you had with the junta at that point, talking about Russia, talking about the potential agreement to sell uranium to I Iran. But unfortunately, it appeared it backfired backfired based on their statement. Now at the same time, during all of this, the United States has formally declared a coup back in October that legally prevents the United States from providing the new regime with security assistance. So it seems that our approach to Niger and our approach to this junta is divided and disconnected. And it's sort of a two-prong approach in that one, I get it. We want to support our democracy and our values, but two, we're trying to be friendly with this junta. And it's leading to a point where we have a kind of a, a judgment of Solomon and that we're splitting the goals. And what we don't want is it to leave us with nothing because we know that nothing will be filled by China, by Russia, by Iran. We also know that the, uh, the VEOs, the violent extremist organizations, are not going to stop in Niger. There's going to be consequences throughout the Sahel. As the DNI put out its threat, its annual threat assessment last, in, uh, I think it was uh, recently, the instability in Sahel is going to raise, especially in Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, raises the likelihood that the crisis will metastasize and spill over to the littorals of Africa. And so my question to Doctor, my question to General Langley, is what is our coherent and consistent strategy towards Niger? And what do we plan to do to prevent Russia, China, and Iran from filling that void? And what do we plan to do in order to continue our effort, which I think is necessary, to go after the VEOs in that area? Thank you, Congressman. I think you've framed the dilemma and the challenges extremely well, and I fully agree with your assessment. I would like to clarify that uh, at this point, the CNSP, the uh, self-identified government of Niger, has not uh, asked uh, or demanded that the United States military depart. Uh, there is actually quite a mixed message. Um, we are following up and seeking clarification. What they have declared is that they have uh, declared the SOFA, the Status Forces Agreement, right. uh, to be uh, non-operational. They have assured us that American military forces are protected and they will take no action that would endanger them. So while we work through that with them, uh, we are uh, seeking ways to be able to continue to have access and ability to conduct counter-VEO operations. That said, I will just foot stomp something you mentioned, which is uh, countries that are run by military juntas are not reliable security partners, and part of the value proposition for us having access in Niger would be a return to democratic civilian rule in Niger. Got it. General Langley. Congressman, I'll just give a, an operational uh, viewpoint Please. Uh, as far as, because this is, this is a question of uh, strategic access uh, at the uh, great power uh, competition level. It's essential. 
is essential that uh, we double down uh, with uh, within the, the authorities that we still have at the imposition of 7008. But I would just take a regional view on that. Uh, we do need to engage with other countries to increase their partnership and capacity. Uh, we need uh, more take uh, take take the uh, disinformation uh, campaign. We need to hit it uh, uh, front and center front and center because Russia does have a passing game. Now they have a, uh, a ground game as well with the Russian core and uh, being introduced in Mali. Being Gentlemen's time's expired. Kino Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. This is uh, Colonel Mamade Dumbuya, and this is a photo of, of him. Did we train and equip him? By name, I, I cannot identify that. Well, that's him with a bunch of U.S. service members outside of our embassy and just months after this photo was taken in 2021, he led a coup in Guinea and, and threw out the, the leader. Does that concern you? Congressman, core values is what we start off with in IMA pro programs. Do we, we share stick core values with Colonel Dembuya? Core values. I will repeat that. He led a coup. We do. So I guess my, uh, I guess four months after that exchange, General Langley, you had General Musa. Bamu overthrow the government in Niger. And it won't surprise anybody here that we trained him. The person who overthrew the democratically elected government in Niger went to the National Defense University, trained at Fort Benning, Georgia. So do we share core values with Musa Bamu? Congressman, let me just go ahead and state that uh, core values is what we start off with. But there is no syllabus for overthrowing the government, not in our institutions. Well, so they're poor. learning it pretty well, even in the absence of a syllabus, right? Because if you look at Chad, Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, in a lot of these countries, the coup is led by someone we trained. Now, I put in the National Defense Authorization Act a requirement for you to issue us a report as to how many coup leaders our taxpayers have funded the training for. That report is due tomorrow. Will we be getting it on time? I'll do a follow-up on that, Congressman. Well, I mean, this, this yeah. was the follow-up, right? Because first I asked you in that clip, how many coup leaders did we train? You didn't know. And so then I put it in the law for you to tell me. The law requires you to tell me by tomorrow. So can you give us a preview of coming attractions? Uh, you get that. You'll get your answer, uh, Congressman. Just but, but, but let me say, let me say, there's no correlation. And there's no causation of U.S. training to these members. Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. Because in like a dozen countries, the coup leaders are people we trained. Like, what a difference a year makes. March 16th, 2023, Secretary Blinken calls Niger, quote, a model of resilience, a model of democracy, a model of cooperation. One year and one day later, Dr. Wallander, the spokesperson of the Nigeri military, Colonel Amadou Amabrame, says, quote, the American presence in the territory of the Republic of Niger is illegal. A, a year and a day after our government said they were the model of resilience and democracy, they are throwing us out by the scruffs of our neck. And so is it safe to say that this failed, General Langley? It's safe to say that there's no correlation or causation of U.S. training to a coup happening, well, uh, period. It certainly isn't. There's no causation or correlation to the training we do creating more stability. I'm trying to ascertain whether or not all this money we spend in Africa makes the place less stable or more stable. And just for a country lawyer like me, if we're funding the coup leaders, that probably strikes me as making it less stable. Now, are you aware of the Iranian efforts to now mine in Niger? General Langley? Congressman, we could talk about it in a classified section on that. Well, I mean, Fox News is reporting it. They're saying that Iran is working on, on economic arrangements to get uranium from Niger. So. Well, in a classified section, we would talk uh, real intel. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, we've spent more than 500 million in the country. What can you say we've got for that 500 million as we sit here today? If it's like being turned into an Iranian mine, the Russians are the preferred security partner, and, and we're training the coup leaders. There was a, a buy down on uh, an insurance policy for protecting uh, the homeland. 
I don't think we're doing that, though. I, I don't think there's, a, there's evidence to suggest that. That's like, your opinion. You, you went to Niger. I respect, okay. I respect your opinion. Okay, but well, General Langley, not. you went to Niger, and, and, and you went to have a meeting with the people we trained who overthrew the democratically elected government, and Fox News is reporting that you didn't even get a meeting with the principal decision maker. Is that right? I had a meeting with my counterpart. Well, uh, here's the quote. Sources say last week's meeting with the junta was extremely difficult. The administration's envoys did not get to meet with Niger's principal decision maker. Is that a true statement or is that a false statement? My responsibility is to meet with my counterpart, not not not. I would not just hope that if not we can two leaders, Gentlemen's we could at least book a meeting. You know, since it's the model of democracy. Gentlemen's time's general. expired. Chair, and I recognize a general lady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Hulan. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to listen and learn from you, and thank you for your service to the country. Was hoping, uh, generals, that I could ask you to reflect a little bit on some of the um, history of this nation, uh, specifically interested in going back to June 6th of 1944, which was D-Day, which I'm certain you all know. Can you uh, tell me, to the degree that you recall your education and your history, what happened on that day? Obviously, that's Operation Overlord going into Normandy. Um, I did command the 82nd Airborne Division, which has a strong history, um, and to help liberate the first uh, city liberated was St. Mary Glees. And we're coming up on our 80th anniversary uh, this year. And, uh, and General Langley, do you have any reflections on that day? Yes, uh, I was at the 79th, and I'm planning to go into the 80th. And seeing those uh, that, those members that went across that beach, um, it was memorable. And being able to meet with them uh, was very telling of uh, those that uh, had uh, what we call uh, common valor. Uh, and that was uh, very striking. And it, it was able to, all the generations that followed, uh, as far as our war fighting ethos uh, and supporting and and protecting our Constitution uh, and serving in the military in the United States uh, has gone through from the great, greatest generation to present. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go to the 75th uh, anniversary as well, and it was a remarkable uh, observation of a really powerful moment in history when we were able to liberate uh, Europe and we were able to lead with our values. And um, the reason why I'm asking this is... I would love to be able to ask you specific questions about this posture hearing, but I'm so uh, troubled by the fact that I believe history is repeating itself again. I'm so deeply concerned that we're in 1939 again and that we're ignoring our common shared history, uh, which led us, because of isolationism, because of inaction, to uh, participating in World War II, arguably too late. Um, arguably, we could have stopped it earlier than we did, and arguably D-Day didn't ever have to happen, uh, in my opinion. We are heading into the 80th anniversary of D-Day, and my understanding is the Speaker of the House is really interested and excited in going to the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And I'm just struck by the uh, irony, I don't even know what the right word is, that we will observe that uh, and not understand that we could indeed prevent something like that from happening again if we, the Congress, could act on the supplemental and on the Senate's bill that's already passed, if we could help Ukraine uh, fight the fight that is the fight for all of us, for democracies around the world. I was hoping that you all could comment on how you're seeing from your, um, your history, your heritage, your uh, careers, what is unfolding in Europe. I recognize that's not your area of interest right now, but would love to understand how you reflect on it in terms of the history that we are all facing right now. And I don't expect any specific answer. I'm genuinely interested in your thoughts. I'm keenly interested, obviously, because we have Russia in our AOR, Congresswoman, um, they're in Syria. They got their, they have a warm water port now in Tartus. They have an air base in Latakia. Um, and we watch what Russia is doing both in Ukraine. I talk to Chris Cavoli on a routine basis as he updates me what's happening. And I watch Iran's support to Russia in their illegal invasion of Ukraine. He's made it clear, Putin has made it clear this is an imperial effort to retake Russian territory, so to speak, and his intentions have been clear, and he's executed on those intentions. General Langley, do you have any comments as well? 
as uh, activities uh, that uh, Russian Federation is doing on the continent of Af Africa is uh, very destabilizing. And what they're doing just uh, from the geopolitical uh, uh, piece of it, they're trying, they want to change the rules-based international order, and they want to reshape uh, the world uh, economic order uh, as well. Uh, just doing it through uh, socioeconomic coercion and also dependence. Uh, here we have a military construct, and we will uh, put a court on around uh, your junta, uh, new, newly formed governments in exchange for mining concessions. All those mining concessions uh, go up uh, to uh, the Russian Federation. And I appreciate you, gentlemen, very much. I have only eight seconds left, but the reason I ask these questions is because I would urge our speaker to please allow us to vote on the Senate package so that we cannot have another D-Day. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska. Mr. Thank Blake. you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate all three of you being here. Uh, my first question deals with Iran. Uh, so looking on the, the left side of the uh, dais over there. Now, Iran has attacked us. How many attacks have there been done against our forces by proxy forces? I lost the count. In which country, Congressman? Well, just combined. When you look at Iraq, Syria... Um, Iraq and Syria, it's about 175 since the, uh, right. about 46 days ago. And the Houthis, which is an Iranian proxy, um, the numbers are upwards of 200. Man, that's just an incredible number. What concerns me is we're, we strike back at the proxy forces. I don't think Iran cares. I don't think Iran cares if you hit their junior partners you know, in the nose. They care if you hit them in the nose. So why haven't we made a, gone after Iran more directly? Because I don't think we can deter them by just going after their proxy forces. And I, uh, probably more of a policy question, but I defer to whoever wants to answer. Uh, thank you, Congressman. We have struck, and I would defer to General Carrillo on details. Um, we have struck Iranian assets in, uh, that are used to launch those attacks against Amer or American or partnered forces uh, in Iraq uh, and in, in Syria. Um, so we have struck at those to erode their effectiveness, but also to signal uh, that we will strike at Iranian uh, forces that are threatening Americans. I believe if we don't go after Iran more directly, they're going to see it as weakness, and they're just going to keep amplifying these attacks. We've already lost three Americans on the border of Jordan, and I just, I guess I implore a more aggressive thing, because I think in the end, once Iran knows we're serious, uh, they'll, they'll have those proxy forces back off. Uh, my, my view anyway. Uh, to General Langley, what is the impact of what's going on in Niger operationally to us? Thanks for the question, Congressman. Uh, as we uh, approach, uh, our operational approach would be to deter threats holistically. And the, the greatest end state is being able to protect the homeland. All of those violent extremist organizations, whether we're talking about ISIS Sahel, ISIS West Africa, uh, JNM, or or uh, or any other faction, uh, Boko Haram is still alive and well. Um, we need to be able to do indications and warnings. We need to be able to monitor and respond, and that's what we need. You know, long endurance ISR. So the impacts will be great if uh, we lo lose our posture. Is there alternative countries to Nigeria that we can operate out of? Congressman, uh, we're exploring that now, and I can talk okay. uh, more in the closed session about uh, because it's in the diplomatic realm right now. Outside of maybe Egypt, what are some other nations that are working closely with us that we should be investing in and, and nurturing better in Africa? I'd say that uh, I'll just take for East Africa and Somalia, for instance. Uh, you know, we're working and uh, to uh, be able to support the the, the uh, efforts to run the campaign, uh, help uh, President Salman Muhammad run the campaign. But there's other uh, countries there as well, uh, Turkey, UAE, uh, the UK. So they call that the Quint. Mm -hmm. uh, it's way ahead uh, for sustaining operations in Somalia. A follow up uh, to General Carrillo when it comes to Af Afghanistan. So we, I think we have enough evidence to say Al Qaeda is re-establishing itself in Afghanistan or reconstituting. Uh, their leader w was killed there for, for starters, and I'm, we're reading about training camps. Can you give us a little more information? What is Al Qaeda doing in Afghanistan? Um, in a classified session, I can give you great detail. 
Um, but I would tell you that we do see the Taliban as harboring al-Qaeda. They're also harboring Triki Taliban Pakistani and other violent extremist organizations. The only one that they're actively fighting is ISIS Khorasan. Right. I think it's important for our citizens to know what, what we can tell them because we saw what happened prior to 9-11, and now we're seeing the same Taliban regime partnering with al-Qaeda, and I think there's a future threat uh, to our country there. So with that, I, I appreciate it your leadership, and thank, thank you for being here today. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair would uh, announce that, uh, remind folks that we are going to uh, have a classified session after this public session. So the, classified, uh, the public session will end just before 1 o'clock. We'll go into classified session. We'll be called for votes at 1.30. So just as a reminder um, for awareness. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Moulton from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in, in recent months, U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria have faced approximately 167 attacks by Iran-backed militias, and in Jordan, three U.S. service members were, of course, tragically killed by an Iranian-linked drone attack. So many Americans are wondering why we still have troops in the region and are asking what our service members are fighting for. General Carrillo, how would you explain why maintaining a small U.S. troop presence in Jordan, Syria, and Iraq uh, serves U.S. interests as a good investment in international security and ultimately makes us safer back home. Thanks, Congressman. Um, we have forces in Iraq and Syria for the enduring defeat of ISIS. And if I could describe ISIS for you, um, we have ISIS at large. Those are those that we are going after um, every day, every night. Um, about 1,500 inside of Syria and about 1,000 inside of uh, Iraq. You have an army, an ISIS army in detention 9,000 of them across 27 detention facilities in Syria, about 20,000 inside of Iraq. I don't worry so much about the detention inside Iraq. I worry about those that are inside Syria. And the last category is the next potential generation of ISIS, and those are the ones that are in the Al Hall and Al Roj camps. It used to be 70,000, now it's down to about 43,000. I was just there two and a half weeks ago. Um, it is my assessment, if that we were to completely pull out, that you would see a resurgence of ISIS in about one to two years. So what we are doing is we are defending forward. We are going after those forces. The ones that we specifically target inside of Syria are those that are trying to break out that ISIS army. Um, and they did that in January of 2022, um, where they broke out, there was 4,400 in one detention facility. 1,000 made it outside of the camp killed 125 of our SDF partners, but there was 450 of them killed, the rest were captured, and about 100 got away. And to be clear, they're interested in attacking the United States. And the next ones we go after are those that are doing external operations defined as outside of Iraq and Syria, and we have thwarted several of those that would be really against Western interests in, the, in uh, Eurasia or uh, in Europe. Would you recommend to the President that we withdraw our troops from Iraq? I would not until the conditions are met that Iraq can handle that fight by themselves. Dr. Wallander, would you recommend to the President that we withdraw our troops from Iraq? I would not on the conditions that General Carrilla also um, articulated. Dr. Wallander, some uh, suggest that U.S. troops are just a target for rival nations and actually increase tension in the region. How would you push back on that argument? Uh, U.S. forces are a target, in particular because Iran seeks to eject the United States from the Middle East so that it can have free operational uh, access uh, and effects uh, that are very contrary to American national security interests, as we're seeing in the Red Sea um, and elsewhere in the Middle East. And, of course, this isn't just the case in the Middle East. Um, General Langley, you wrote in your written statement that, quote, if we fail in Africa, our strategic competitors will move in. How does the U.S. military presence in Africa counter Russia and China? Uh, so, uh, Congressman, with our approach as uh, codified in national security strategy, uh, building partnership capacity where it needs to be African-led. Uh, so in order for it to be African-led in their security construct, they're, they're developing armies. Uh, they need our assistance to be able to, so they have the capability and capacity to deter threats. And of course, China is not just competing with us in the military realm. So where do you find that you run into limits of what you're able to do as a military command uh, going up against a real whole of nation effort from China and Russia, and where does the interagency need to do more? Now, Congressman, across the board, uh, like I said, we are losing uh, the disinformation 
uh, be, uh, from the Russian Federation. We need to meet that with with the truth. So as far as you know, the Global Engagement Center from the, uh, from uh, the State Department or other activities, we need to close a say do gap. We're doing a lot across USAID and and the uh, State Department and, and as also uh, within DOD, but we're not telling the story. We're not telling the story because we're getting drowned out by the disinformation campaign across civil society and also to the militaries in the hell. And that's what we get. Uh, we, we're not saying that uh, Russia caused it, but they did, did accelerate the coup d'etats, as you're seeing in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. So would you say, General, that disinformation is a national security threat to the United States? Absolutely it is. It really is. It's very compelling, especially in civil society, especially for the young generation uh, uh, that's uh, the youth bulge across the African countries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. I'm sorry, Mr. Waltz. Big difference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, General Carrillo, these should be, I think, very easy questions, but important to get on the record. On the Abigate families, I understand the reinvestigation is complete, correct? The supplemental review is complete, and out of respect for the families, we're going to uh, be briefing them in the next several weeks. Can I ask, uh, they have repeatedly asked me that you have those families together we for that briefing rather than individually? 100%, Congressman. They're all, we've invited them to a specific date, and we have many of them that have- Can I also ask that we have no time limit on that briefing? Like there will be no Lock time. them in the room until they're done asking questions. We will stay as long as they want and answer all the questions. Fantastic. Can I also ask, and you know, here, here's a tough one, but can we declassify whatever needs to be declassified to give them the answers they need or give them temporary read-ons? I don't care, but let's we not have- We are doing the latter. Congressman, and we Fantastic. are giving them all the information that they require. That's great to hear. Thank you, General Carrillo. Now let's switch to, I think, some very important statements you've made on Iran. I think the best way to stop the Houthis is to dry up the supplies from Iran. I agree. And the best way to do that is to dry up the cash in Tehran, correct? I agree. And as you've said, that um, Iran's selling 90% of its illegal, illicit, ch sanctioned oil to China, correct? Correct. So really, the heart of the matter, and let's just, you know, nothing like visuals, let's, let's look at all of Iranian oil that is going this way, right? I mean, the money is here, and the money is coming from here, correct? Interestingly, correct. though, the oil coming from Gulf and other partners that are coming through here to Europe, that's what the Houthis are hitting, correct? They are. So... Going back to the money in Iran, we've got Hezbollah being funded by Iran. Correct. Correct. We have Hamas being funded by Iran. Correct. Correct. We have the Houthis being funded by Iran. Correct. Correct. We've got the, all the militias in, our, in Iraq. And we so now have dead Americans because of the money being going back to Iran. Correct. All roads go back to Iran, but really, it's Chinese money that is fueling Iran, that is fueling terrorism. 90% of the Iranian oil goes to China. And yet all of our policy is focused on the symptoms of the disease, a, now a port dealing with the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, a coalition shooting down $50,000 drones with $2 million missiles. Uh, now the Houthis are threatening to go at the Indian Ocean as well. We've got shipping being diverted all the way around the Cape of Good Hope. Our policy is focused on the symptoms, not the core problems, not the disease, which is Beijing and their relationship and funding of Tehran. Would you disagree with that? I think Iran is the single biggest malign actor in the Middle East. So here's my question. Dr. Wallander, responsible for policy, how have we fundamentally shifted our policy to dry up the cash in Iran? And please don't tell me the oil is sanctioned. I know the sanctions. The House has passed the SHIP Act, which will put secondary sanctions on the shipping companies, the ports, the Chinese buyers. Would you support that as a matter of policy? Secondary sanctions on China. Congressman, I, your analysis is compelling. On the specific question, I would have to defer to the Treasury Department, which is responsible well, for you as a matter. So here's the problem, Dr. Wallander, and you just kicked the can there. Nice try. Bad policy has these generals and our military 
Yeah, I mean, the bad policy is the tail wagging the dog here, running around being as target practice around the desert and in the Red Sea. Meanwhile, what are the consequences of that? Well, we are burning naval readiness, are we not, in the Red Sea and in the Mediterranean? General Carrilla? We're using a lot of munitions. We're burning readiness. For every month that a ship's extended, you're burning two months uh, that now has to be in dry dock. We're out of amphibs. Uh, you know the big winner here? The big winner is China. Because rather than those ships being in the Indo-Pacific, they're running around the Red Sea and they're running around the Mediterranean, and now we're going to build a port. <laughs> I mean, I know we're going to talk about it in a classified se session, General Carrilla, but are you very, are you extremely concerned about force protection for that port from force drones, from missiles, from uh, underwater unmanned vehicles, all of Gentleman's which will be supplied by Iran? Gentlemen's time's this expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from New Jersey, Ms. Cheryl. Thank you. Um, General Carrilla, I believe there are over a million people um, in Rafa right now. Um, I was just recently at the Rafa crossing on the Egyptian side, and then we went to Israel. Um, and the Israelis are suggesting that they are continuing their plans for an invasion of Rafa. And so if you're thinking about the vetting that would need to take place to move that population, and if you're thinking about um, the humanitarian corridor that has to happen, would you say that those, that group of people, that population could be moved out of Rafah for an invasion in two weeks? Um, Madam, I believe the uh, number is about 1.3 million um, that's in Rafa. I was at the Rafa gate uh, two and a half weeks ago as well. Um, I believe it'll take weeks. I can't give you, without seeing their definitive plan, I cannot give you a timeline. And to your knowledge, is there uh, a, currently a place in Gaza uh, that is set up to receive 1.3 million people um, should they be moved from Rafa? I don't know of a place right now, ma'am. Thank you. And as we're looking at um, the new require, or not the new, the traditional requirements that the United States has as um, outlined in the recently signed National Security Memorandum 20, the memorandum reiterates that the Secretary of State must assess the assurances that human rights and humanitarian laws are being upheld by a recipient of U.S. defense articles and services. Um, as Israel continues its fight to uproot and destroy the Hamas terror network, um, we've seen the casualty rates of civilians, including children, and a looming humanitarian crisis. So can you explain how your headquarters will monitor the situation, collect information, and report your assessments and findings to the State Department regarding the requirements of the National Security Memorandum 20? So I believe that comes from both um, verbal and written assurances from reliable and credible assurances that they will follow um, the law of armed conflict with the weapons provided. Um, I am and not, humanitarian. Yeah, I am not involved in the, uh, the advising for the day-to-day -day ground operations or air operations. So you've not been asked to provide any information as to whether or not um, as to provide any information for the assessment? I have not. Um, and so the National Security Memorandum 20 requires assurances to include that the recipient country will facilitate the transport and delivery of U.S. humanitarian assistance and U.S. government support of IGO efforts. Not deny, not restrict, not impede. So Dr. Wallander, what more must Israel do to facilitate aid? Do you believe Israel should provide security for the transport and delivery of humanitarian aid? And what of the practice of turning away full shipments with a single dual-use item. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Yes, Israel has, uh, has an obligation on many counts uh, for allowing for access to humanitarian assistance. We are working with them now, or CENTCOM is working now with Israel on the 
line of effort on the maritime delivery access. Um, and we are working daily with Israel on ground uh, transport, including increasing the number of trucks uh, moving along those ground transports and access. Um, and we've worked with them on clarifying issues of uh, inspection that Israel uh, requires to be able to, to, in order to approve the movement of specific shipments. And is that ground transport in, within Gaza as well, or simply ground transport to get to the access points of Gaza? The focus of our conversation with Israel is access to Gaza, and separate arrangements are being worked right now uh, for the inter security of and, and internal distribution, safe distribution of the humanitarian assistance inside of Gaza. And do you intend to um, publicly provide what those provisions will be? Once they are, uh, I think they will become public once they are finalized, and we're working on that because now uh, this maritime access is, is ready to move, and we are seeing uh, additional movements uh, on Israel's support for ground transportation. And do you have a timeline for any of this? Uh, I don't have a timeline for you on the ground transportation right now, Congresswoman, and I think General Carrilla noted the first half of April on the maritime access. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from Michigan. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Ms. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Carrillo, last year you highlighted the fact that you were suffering, suffering from a su significant drop in ISR capabilities in Afghanistan since the August 2021 withdrawal. Former Chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, testified this week before the House Foreign Affairs Committee that the withdrawal was a strategic failure. Um, in your testimony today, you highlight that both ISIS-K and Al-Qaeda are using Afghanistan as a safe haven. You also say that the Taliban's inability or unwillingness to rein in violent extremist organizations could destabilize Central and South Asia. General, do you, due to the continued lack of ISR in Afghanistan, can you explain how the 2020, uh, 2021 withdrawal has opened up the United States and our allies to increased terror threats? Congresswoman, my number one priority is to protect the homeland, to prevent an attack from coming out of Afghanistan. But every day I am balancing risk. I'm balancing risk between an attacks in Iraq and Syria, the Red Sea and Afghanistan, and I'm dynamically shifting ISR to be able to do that and manage that risk based on the imminent threats. And we do that on a daily basis. Um, what we are seeing internal to Afghanistan right now is an increase in um, activity of the violent extremist organizations. We are working with our partners, that includes Pakistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, who have access into these countries and tremendous insight, both through their human networks, to be able to understand exactly what has happened to augment the airborne ISR that we have. With the continued lack of ISR, though, how can the, administra the administration actually effectively monitor any Iranian or CCP uh, influence efforts in, in Afghanistan? So not, not all ISR is airborne, so I would tell you that, you know, when we look at the intelligence piece of it, we're looking for human as well as we try to rebuild some of the human networks since we have pulled out to be able to monitor that. We work through our partners as well. So, so do we have more boots on the ground then? We don't have any boots on the ground. So what you can have is you can do over the horizon human, and we can also work through partners and allies. And, and how are those going? I think we are getting some insights. It is very difficult. There's also in a classified setting, I can tell you some of the other means in which we monitor them. Have you requested additional assets be deployed to Afghanistan? I have identified the requirements that I have to the Department of Defense. So you have identified them. Have you requested them? I don't think any combatant commander, I've had, I have requested them. I don't think okay. any combatant commander right. has the numbers they need. What is the response from the secretary in the White House regarding those requests or again, identifications? Again, I would say that there's no combatant commander, Mike Langley included, who doesn't have all the resources that they require. But what I do is identify the risk of not getting those. Oh, okay, I'm, maybe we're not tracking here. You have identified the need, correct? Correct. And what has the response been from the secretary in the White House? So we re get, we've, we've received some assets, some other things I've requested I have not received. And so based on that, 
I adjust my ISR throughout the region to identify the risk at the time. Would you say you received 10%, 20%, 80%, 90% of what you've requested? I couldn't give you exact percentage right now, ma'am. Give me a gut feel. I, I'm trying to. Well, <laughs> I want to be accurate. This I'm is a provide. big. This is a very concern. Uh, very well, it is, and I mean, we have. Re so, what you look at the requirements. The only place I'm not being shot at right now is Afghanistan. Um, so Yet. I. Had, <laughs> so I'm adjusting that ISR where we were being shot at in, in Iraq and Syria. And, and I, I put under, it on. And I understand protection. that. I understand that, sir. I'm just trying to get an answer to my question. So you've requested some. Some could be a little. A lot? You, you don't have any gut feel on, you know, I've requested X and I've received Y? I, I do know the number of what I've requested. A lot of it's big wing ISR to be able to do things in. What I can do is I get ISR in one area, I can shift it over to another area. But we are at a reduced number inside of Afghanistan right now. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I know the world is focused on violent conflicts in Gaza and Ukraine, as they should be, and the potential threat of China moving against Taiwan, but the threat of terrorism is looming, right? Afghanistan right now is a hotbed for terrorism. It is. I, I, I mean, it's... It, Afghanistan has fallen back into the hands of the Taliban, which has no interest in, in deterring terrorism against the West. It is imperative that Congress provide CENTCOM the necessary resources to better monitor and engage in ne necessary any potential terror threats. Thank you. General Lee's time's expired. Chair, and I recognize General Lee from California, Ms. Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to our witnesses. Um, first, General Langley, uh, I know that we spoke already about Southcom's Human Rights Office. Um, I just wanted, uh, on the record, can you commit uh, today to working with me to try and help uh, AFRICOM create a similar capacity and uh, to make sure that we're giving you the resources you need on, on human rights in the region? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I also really want to thank you for your comments earlier on the importance of the whole of government response to violent extremism, especially through the Global Fragility Act. And I was wondering if you could briefly discuss the ways in which DOD has contributed to the Global Fragility Act so far, and in particular, how the civil affairs teams in coastal West Africa have been in U.S. strategic interests. Congresswoman, thanks for that question. Because our integrated approach uh, into the AFRICOM campaign plan, uh, Global Fragility Act is at the center of that. Uh, I'll just give you an example of uh, uh, Ambassador Davis Ba in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, they're one of the first ones to get their country plan done. But as I start uh, with helping them as they ask us, we want a whole government approach to, to fight terrorism. Uh, so that's where they are building out their governance, but also working on the security construct, too, in unison, codified within that uh, campaign plan. So they are showing that they take the leading edge at implementing uh, the spirit and intent of the Global Fragility Act. Thank you so much. Um, General Carrillo, I'll turn to you. Um, as you know, the War Powers Resolution requires the White House to submit a report within 48 hours of the onset of hostilities. Um, a key role in this is to start the 60-day clock uh, as part of the War Powers Resolution. So um, for the purposes of the War Powers Resolution and its 60-day restriction, when did hostilities begin with respect to U.S. military involvement in the Red Sea, Yemen, and the Gulf of Aden against the Houthis after October 7th? I believe for the Houthis, I think our first strike was around 12 January. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to note, I, re I recognize the administration views the strikes against Iranian proxies uh, in Iraq and Syria as covered by both the 2001 and 2002 AUMF. Um, but uh, that no one has tried to make that case about the ongoing hostilities with the Houthis. Uh, and so I, uh, I hope that I can receive from your office and, and that you can commit to a written analysis of when the 60-day clock uh, will be running out and when and if you'll be coming to Congress for the authorization needed per the War Powers Resolution. I would defer to policy and the administration on that one. Dr. Wander. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, the um, assessment of the interagency lawyers group is that the operations in uh, against uh, Houthi threats and attacks on shipping uh, is covered by uh, the president's inherent uh, right under Article 2 and uh, the authority of the combatant commander uh, to authorize strikes uh, in, in self-defense of U.S. assets and forces. I think a, a key part of the War Powers re Resolution is 
continuing and ongoing, which is a key part of the administration's messaging around uh, that. So uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation um, and making sure that you all are in compliance uh, with the law, uh, the War Powers Resolution. Um, lastly, um, I will turn um, uh, again to General Langley. Um, we've seen an increasing number of regional players in Africa, uh, including Turkey and the UAE. Um, in fact, both of these uh, have recently played spoilers in various conflicts, um, particularly in Ethiopia and in Sudan. How often do you meet with the UAE and Turkey to raise our interest on the African context? And then General Carilla and Secretary Wallander, um, recognizing that we have many priorities and a complicated relationship with both those countries, how do we ensure that our African interests are raised at a high enough level? Congresswoman, as, as far as uh, Turkey and UAE, uh, no direct contact. I'll just say uh, in Somalia uh, with uh, President Salah Sheikh Mohammed uh, taking all players that's going to be able to help build out his, his army. Uh, they have established a Quint, but Ambassador Fee, she goes to the Quint uh, meetings on that. So I don't have any direct mill to mill uh, with them other than deconfliction of the airspace. In terms of uh, Turkey, we have just deconfliction of airspace in the mill to mill domain because that's actually a UCOM uh, country. Um, and in terms of our relationship with Turkey, in, in particular in Africa and Somalia, um, Turkey has uh, contributed to capacity building, and we believe that's positive. We just ask that Turkey, in particular, uh, make sure to keep us informed of those operations. Generally, it's time's expired here, and I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Jackson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. I appreciate your time. Uh, with the recent focus being uh, most of the time focused on uh, Indo-PACOM, uh, this hearing is a great example of why we can't uh, lose focus of the threats in AFRICOM and CENTCOM, so appreciate you being here and give us an update on that. Uh, in 2023, I led a CODEL along with my uh, colleague, Ms. Jacobs, uh, to CENTCOM and AFRICOM to learn firsthand about some of the unique challenges faced in your respective AORs. Last week, Russia, China, and Iran concluded their annual sea, belt or sea security belt exercise in the Gulf of Oman, which included a large number of troops, warships, aviation assets, along with numerous other nations participating through observer status. These joint drills promote cooperation between China, Russia, and Iran while sending an undeniable signal to the U.S. and to our allies. Uh, the aggression in the Red Sea has certainly been the focal point for our forces, but a major joint exercise being conducted by our strongest adversaries happened right outside of our bases in Bahrain, Qatar, and the UAE. General Carilla, does this type of hostile military activity cause an increase in the regional tension as the military ties amongst our adversarial nations grow around us? Uh, how much does it undermine our efforts in the Red Sea? And what, do, what other concerns do you have uh, for CENTCOM? Thanks, Congressman. Appreciate that. Uh, what we call the Chinru exercise was done in the Indian Ocean. I don't think it raised reasonable tension, but it just does show this relationship that we're seeing between China, Iran, and Russia of interest. Um, the Houthis just announced that Russia and China have a buy on any movement through the Red Sea. So what you're seeing is Iran is using its proxy to allow access for Russia and, uh, and China to go through the Red Sea while blocking access to others and the Houthis even give it wrong when they hit a ship uh, about two weeks ago that was carrying Russian oil from the North Sea um, to India. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And, and I have some, some following questions I'll ask you in the classified portion. Um, I have one more question uh, uh, for you, uh, General Langley. Uh, East Africa sits in, in, a, in a critical area which has seen corruption and heightened hostilities from violent extremist groups such as al-Shabaab and ISIS. Uh, as I mentioned, I was just in Somalia last year where I got an understanding of the threats that exist, uh, but in that region, the situation on the ground can and does shift daily. Uh, in the last decade, the PRC opened a military base uh, on the continent of Africa right next to our American base in Djibouti. Um, simultaneously, Russia is increasing its footprint there and, and, and hoping also to establish a base in East Africa. General, uh, as, as both Russia and China establish significant footprints on the, on the east coast of Africa, what would be the impact to, to AFRICOM and what is going to be the impact to AFRICOM in the security of our U.S. forces in Djibouti and Somalia? And what impacts does the presence of China and Russia have on your relationships with other nations in the area and our ability to uh, continue to establish influence there? 
Congressman, thanks for that question. I mean, it goes part and parcel what uh, my buddy uh, uh, General Carrillo says as we look at the Red Sea and look at the Gulf of Aden and the impacts. Uh, very uh, much a strategic uh, sea lines of communication. So I am very much uh, interested in uh, what the thinly veiled uh, reasons or purpose that, uh, that China in, in uh, entrenchment into Dor Le uh, Djibouti uh, as far as their purpose of being there. And they say it's for counter piracy or, or goodwill. We're not seeing that because, as uh, as General Corolla can probably attest to, uh, that in the past uh, a few months, uh, there's been a number of Mayday calls. Uh, and every other country within uh, the construct that uh, uh, they have executing the, the anti uh, piracy or uh, response to the Houthis activities, uh, China never made one one attempt to come to the aid of a ship in distress. So it's thinly veiled as far as the purpose of why they're at Dorlay. I think it's for power projection or A2AD, anti-excess or air denial reasons. Thanks, sir. Yeah, I, I think most of us here would, uh, would doubt their stated intentions and don't trust them uh, at, at all. Um, I have one more question that I'm going to defer mainly to, uh, to, to the classified section, but I do have some questions about the port in Gaza. And I would like to know, and I think you said, uh, General Carrillo, that, uh, that you might be able to, to expound upon this, on what kind of reassurances we're going to have that, uh, that, that, our, that our troops that are involved in this are going to be safe. And then also, uh, for Ms. Wallander, I'd like to know as well, what do we have in place uh, uh, that we can ensure, and, and generally can uh, contribute to this as well, that uh, we are going to make sure that these resources are not going to Hamas. Uh, because uh, it's been my experience that, you know, as much as, uh, you know, there, there's a need to help uh, Palestinians that are caught, that are trapped in this situation, that uh, by and large, uh, it's almost impossible to do that without uh, resupplying and refurbishing and taking care of Hamas first, uh, because they control a lot of what's happening in the, in the region. So I'll defer that for the uh, classified section. I know you can't elaborate too much on that here. So with that, I yield back the remainder of my time. Thanks, sir. I thank the gentleman. Chair, now I recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. McClellan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Um, my first question is for Secretary Wallander and uh, General Langley. I have been deeply concerned by the dramatic rate of democratic backsliding that we see uh, in Africa recently, particularly in Western Africa and um, would like to hear how the administration and AFRICOM are working to shore up and support democratic governments on the continent, um, especially those that we would classify as the most vulnerable. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. And we share that concern because without uh, stable, uh, reliable democratic partners, um, we see the effects in the Sahel, in Mali and Burkina Faso, where actually insecurity has risen with, uh, with the rise of military coups and also the access of, of Russian forces. Where Russian forces go, insecurity and instability quickly follow. Uh, what we do is something that General Langley uh, so well laid out, which is the conditions, unfortunately, we, where we see that democratic backsliding um, are created when um, um, demagogic leaders uh, claim that they are being driven by uh, their populations who genuinely are not benefiting from economic prosperity, are suffering from the effects of climate change, um, are not seeing development, for example, of their agriculture, and so their future is viewed as bleak. And that is why it is so core uh, to our mission in Africa to work with State Department, to work with USAID, Department of Agriculture, across the interagency, to build those uh, resiliences and that, that hope, uh, because without that, it's hard to argue to the populations that democratic governance is delivering for the people. You actually anticipated my, my next question, um, which was about how more funding and flexibility for USAID and the State Department would better uh, facilitate interagency planning and co collaboration for a better whole government approach to our, our partners in Africa. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. It is a longstanding uh, position of the Department of Defense that we fully support Congress's provision of capabilities and resources to the State Department, USAID, and other agencies because uh, they are vital partners in creating stability, security, and therefore stable democracies. General Langley, anything you'd like to add on those two questions? ASC Wallander covered uh, 
uh, but he co she covered uh, ninety percent of it. But I'll just tell you when we rolled down the streets this time last week of Niger and seeing some of the uh, propaganda uh, from Russian Federation or of the junta was telling. Our strategic communications, we have, a, we have a ways to go in our narrative and what our intrinsic value, what we have to offer these countries and the whole government in building out their governance. We need to tell a better story. It needs to be compelling, and it needs to be able to go across civil society and, on my part, be able to impart uh, good order and discipline across the forces that is civilian-led. Thank you. Um, and... Africa is also an extremely diverse continent and home to some of the most rapidly industrializing nations on the planet. Um, how are the administration and AFRICOM situating themselves to be nimble and responsive in this increasingly dynamic region? I would say we, again, work with our interagency partners to identify uh, promising partnerships where there is an interest in reading, re, reaching high levels of capability and professionalism in the security sectors, military, but also other aspects of the security sectors. And we work very closely uh, with the State Department in identifying those key countries and opportunities. Thank you. After my assessment across the Sahel, uh, from East Africa to West Africa, I wanted to go down into Southern Africa to see what uh, models of success. I saw that with the uh, South, Southern Africa development community, uh, whereas collectively, uh, they know what right looks like. And uh, with their investments, I think that, just for example, the Lobito Corridor and, and where President Lorenzo of Angola and all the way to Zambia, if they can get that uh, realized and in U.S. investments of prosper under... Uh, uh, the Prosper Africa, uh, I think that we can uh, have the model of excellence, uh, what we're searching for. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Walner, if you could bear with me for a minute. It'll make sense in a minute. Do you believe that U.S. invasion of Normandy, France in uh, June and July 1944 was justified? Yes, Congressman. I, I figured you'd say that. Um, according to the French government, and uh, many and most historians, about 20,000 French civilians were killed in Normandy over that two-month period. Who's, who, do you think, who do you hold responsible for those deaths? I mean, I Vichy France, Free France, the United States, Nazi Germany, who do you hold responsible? An aggregate answer is impossible. One would have to look at individual operations, but I believe that the United States, conduct, even 80 years ago, conducts its operations uh, to prevent civilian harm and does not target civilians. Correct. I would hold Nazi Germany at fault because we wouldn't have bombed Normandy had Hitler not invaded France in May of 1940 to begin with. That's kind of where I'm getting at. Who's ultimately responsible for that? It's Adolf Hitler, Nazi Germany. I think we could probably agree, but limited time that I have. Do you believe that uh, we'd have thousands of IDF forces in Gaza right now had October 7th not happened, where 1,200 civilians were murdered and 200 innocents taken hostage? We've been absolutely clear that the reason for this conflict is Hamas. Right, so there would be no, or at least not a concentration, a massive concentration of forces in, uh, IDF forces in uh, Gaza. According to, I mean, and we'd also agree, IDF doesn't have a policy of targeting civilians, unlike Hamas. Yes, Congressman, okay. that's correct. According to many experts, John Spencer being one of them, who's an urban warfare expert, uh, he said, given the landscape, the IDF has done a uh, remarkable job in protecting Palestinian lives in Gaza, which is particularly not easy considering the fact that Hamas uses civilians as human shields. They don't wear uniforms often. And uh, Hamas has built, I find this interesting, that they built thousands of war tunnels, but not one bomb shelter. And blaming, I think the blame for the civilian deaths in Gaza is Hamas's burden to bear solely. And the other ones with, with blood on their hands. Uh, doctor, you said in your opening statement that you support a long-term solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I do as well. A two-state solution, in fact, you said with specificity. In 2000, Ahud Barak offered Yasser Arafat a two-state solution, including, remarkably, in today's political landscape, all of Jerusalem. And Yasser Arafat refused, 
And he didn't even want to talk about alternative plans unless it included a right of return. And a right of return is so complicated, it is unworkable. I mean, just from a logistical perspective. And we're not going to have, I mean, we've seen after conflicts, massive human movement, uh, Poland, Russia, Germany, Kaliningrad. Uh, uh, I don't think the Ottoman Empire is going to be reconstituted. I certainly don't think the United States is going to give back the Southwest to Mexico. So those are the hard facts of history. So we need to live in, within the bounds of reality. How, do you, how would you affect a two-state solution given the intransigency of the Palestinians on the right of return issue? Congressman, I can't get into the details about a negotiation that would be, you know, with the international support, it would be between Israel and uh, a Palestinian uh, So that's kind entity. of an, I, I just re respectfully, it doesn't, that's really a non-answer. But I, I do think that we're looking at a one-state solution, at least from the Palestinians and Hamas's perspective, and that one-state solution is the rhetoric that we hear about genocide, river to the sea. And that's a genocide of the Jewish people in Israel. Um, General uh, Kurilla, I want to turn your attention towards uh, Afghanistan. 2021, of course, we had a, a withdrawal, and, and, and thank you for your service, by the way. Uh, and we were told when we left by the Biden administration that there would be uh, still we'd be able to conduct robust counterterrorism missions, even though we wouldn't have physical assets or, or presence there. And then uh, I, I think it's interesting that in June of 2023, Joe Biden said, and I quote, do you remember what I said about Afghanistan? I said Al Qaeda would not be there. I said it wouldn't be there. I said we'd get help from the Taliban. What's going on now? What's going on now? Read your press. I was right. And then in your testimony last week in the Senate, you said, and uh, about Afghanistan or about Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, you said, "quote that Al Qaeda still enjoys safe havens in Afghanistan." And in terms of ISIS K, you stated that the Taliban has shown neither the capability nor the intent to sustain adequate countermeasures, uh, counterterrorism pressure. Fair to say, President Biden got that one wrong. I do see Al Qaeda and ISIS K inside of Afghanistan. Okay. Thank you, General uh, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Gentleman Chair. I recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, and to the ranking member for this hearing. Uh, as the Chinese Communist Party continues to strengthen or try to strengthen its influence across the globe through predatory loans and investment projects, I recognize the strategic importance of ensuring that the United States remains the partner of choice amongst uh, African nations. In fact, during my recent travels to Ghana and Kenya, I was encouraged by the breadth of programs that the United States is, in, is supporting to counter CCP influence in the region. Efforts like the U.S.-Kenya Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership, which pr promote uh, mutually beneficial trade relationships. Uh, General Langley, can you speak to the importance of whole-of-government approaches to countering the CCP in Africa? Uh, thanks, Congressman, and, uh, and thank you for making a trip out there. Every time uh, that uh, congressional members of the CODELs uh, uh, go down to the, uh, and, and engage with our African partners is very telling of who their par real partners of choice are and sustaining. So with that, uh, yes, big successes in Kenya. I spoke uh, just previously about uh, what's going on in uh, in uh, Angola, in the Libito Corridor, there's going to be a rail line extended. Uh, that That is counter to the Belt and Road Initiative. That is counter to mining concessions or, or a, a supply chain that China's trying to uh, push forward. So I think we're doing all the right things, but we need to do more, uh, whether it's investments in uh, uh, Prosper Africa or holistically uh, all the other activities that we bring together, a whole of government that pushes our partners to lead it and us enable them across the whole of governments as an answer uh, to what uh, the false offerings or the un unstable offerings that uh, the China is doing through a social economic uh, coercive manner. Thank you. Uh, Generals Langley and Carilla, last year I asked you to describe the threat China and Russia pose in your respective areas of responsibility. Can you describe how in the last year that threat has evolved and what new challenges you're facing? Thanks for that question as well. I'd say that access and influence across across the, the periphery of the continent. Uh, so they have their uh, naval escort uh, task force uh, floating around to doing naval diplomacy. I need more ships. I need more ships so that we can engage. We have Obagami Express. 
Uh, we have the Express Series, uh, I, would, I would say writ large, at different parts to, to include Cutlass Express, engaging with the naval, uh, the naval forces or maritime uh, componency of uh, African countries. China's trying to replicate that. So I, I have one ship, but I would like to have another. Thank you. Congressman, thanks for the question. What we, we really have seen, though, is a big change is that Iran is now selling 90 percent of its oil to China, which then in China, in effect, is funding the malign and subversive behavior of Iran, which then trains funds um, and equips their proxies throughout the region. We do see the instruments of national power that, Iran, uh, that China is using, and that is the diplomatic information, military and economic, especially the economic. With the Belt and Road Initiative, we see that uh, throughout the entire region. It's predominantly focused um, in the CENTCOM region. We've seen them increase their diplomatic effort, upgunning all their uh, senior defense officials and defense attaches, um, very aggressive in the information environment. And the military, what they do is they come in, they open the Amazon catalog, and they say, you can pick anything you want. We'll give you prime shipping. We'll finance it. And there's no end user agreement. And our partners have real security needs. And so one of the things that we can do to counter that is improve our foreign military sales um, capabilities. Thank you. Uh, in my home state of Nevada, my constituents are feeling the effects of the climate crisis every day. Uh, the AFRICOM and CENTCOM theater continue to experience some of the worst, most damaging events. Often they are fast occurring and unpredictable. In June of 2023, U.S. Africa Command and the United States Institute of Peace organized the third Security Implications of Climate Change Symposium, bringing together leaders from across the African continent. Uh, General Langley, can you speak to the importance of these collaborative efforts to address climate-related security challenges throughout Africa, please? Absolutely, and th thanks for that question, because as we look at the drivers of instability uh, across the Sahel, we know that climate change uh, does feed into it. It, it causes de desertification, it, it uh, causes f flooding, and also it impedes on freshwater access. So that's what uh, USAID, they're doing a predictive analysis of the overall effects of climate change, and also uh, 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 groups in that meeting. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was uh, intrigued by, uh, by my my colleague from uh, from Florida and his uh, analysis of really that the that the the source of all this is actually Chinese money, since 90 percent of the oil that Iran uh, is shipping around the world actually ends up in Chinese hands. Then that 500 percent increase in income revenue that uh, Iran has. Uh, has realized in the last two or three years is actually probably coming from running around or getting around the sanctions imposed on the sale of oil. What can we do to, you know, uh, General Correll, what can we do to reimpose, we have the sanctions to actually enforce those sanctions? Congressman, thanks for the question. Sanctions work if it's a international effort. So I would tell you that there needs to be an international effort in the whole of government, our whole of government, diplomatic information, military, economic, and an international effort to enforce those. Well, what can, well, what can we? What, what's a physical thing you can do to enforce that? Because somehow, you know, we're getting word that somehow it was enforced in the past, but it's not being enforced now, these sanctions, which is allowing Iran to gain 500 percent in, uh, in revenue, which is being used against us. What a lot of Iran does is use a series of ghost or dark fleet that are out there not turning on AIS, illegal ship-to-ship -ship transfers, to be able to transfer this oil that eventually makes its way to China. Are they circumventing physical intervention, or, or is it something that you're looking they at? Are. They would have to. I would have to have the authority and the resources to be able to enforce that. Did you have the authority before? I did not. Okay, very good. Um, it's also perverse that somehow, you know, because it's Chinese money that's funding Iran, that then is funding our adversaries. In effect, it's our money that's funding our adversaries because we're China's number one trading partner. Uh, and so, you know, sitting on the, on the China Select Committee, I've taken a, a position that we need to decouple from China as soon as possible. We need to treat China like we treated the Soviet Union. We didn't do much business with the Soviet Union. And fortunately, we're addicted to Chinese goods. We're like drug addicts. And we got, we got to beat this, uh, this addiction that we have to their goods and, st and decouple from them in order, to, uh, in order to hurt them economically so that they can't hurt us 
physically, which is what really what they want to do. And they're uh, taking advantage of it right now, Congressman, when we see what they're doing in the Red Sea by getting a pass from the Houthis, and they've created a separate shipping line that specifically says it'll provide free, you know, safe passage for goods to the Red Sea. Uh, General, the, fa the, the, the faster, you know, it, decoupling from China can't come fast enough for me, to be honest with you. We are, we are funding the instrument of our demise. We ourselves. By, by doing business and continuing to do business with China. I want to, I want to switch gears a little bit here. Um, do you believe that, that the industrial, that our military industrial base needs help? It does, and it needs funding. And if the supplemental is passed, I will tell you that also resupplies the weapons that I have fired in the Red Sea. But a lot of that goes to the industrial base, which allows also for multi-year um, multi production. Because um, they're all, it's an industrial base. They want to see the incentive of how long this is going to last for. So we do need that. Well, that's what I was getting to, that the, the supplement, at least one of the supplements that I've seen from the Senate, there's $60 billion goes to, uh, to uh, Ukraine. Most, I would think most of that is for military aid. There's $10 billion that goes to humanitarian aid for Ukraine, for Israel, and for Gaza. Um, what percentage of that $60 billion will actually be, be, be spent here in the United States? I, I can't speak to that. I'll defer to Dr. Wallander, but I know that for that supplemental, $2.4 billion is for CENTCOM, $686 million is for counter UAS, $157 million resupplies the SM2 missiles, and various other reimbursements for the funds that we've already spent. Well, could uh, Dr. Wallander, can you, can you answer that question real quickly? Yes, the rough estimate that we've heard is that about half of that $60 billion goes for uh, PDA and USAI authority, all of which, uh, while it is security assistance to Ukraine, goes to replenish uh, U.S. forces or to directly procure from U.S. industry. So all of that money goes to the U.S. economy. Well, finally, I want to make this comment that, you know, I, I agree with, uh, some, with the members across the aisle that we need to take a vote on this. Uh, it would damage American reputation in the world that uh, if we walk away from Ukraine, we made them a promise back in the 90s that we'd have their back. They're fighting the fight. They all, all they want are the, are the guns and the weapons. And finally, this one thing, just because uh, Joe Biden doesn't, doesn't secure the southern border doesn't mean that uh, Vladimir Putin can take Ukraine. Uh, that, that correlation to Gentleman's me time is inspired. insane. Thank you. Chair, now recognize gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis. Thanks so much, Mr. Chair, and to the witnesses who are here today. General Langley, as a proud veteran, um, Air Force, I may add, <laughs> we'll go Devil Dogs, I take great pride in the work that the North Carolina National Guard has been doing. Um, it's my understanding that they have had a tremendous impact <clears throat> through the state partnership program in your area of responsibility. Um, could you elaborate on the specific roles and contributions of the North Carolina National Guard in the Republic of uh, Malawi and um, Republic of Zamb Zambia? Congressman, uh, thank, thank you for that uh, question. But uh, let me just holistically talk about state partnership pro uh, program and how it adds to the capacity to uh, our country, uh, our, our partners uh, across the continent. Those countries uh, really uh, treasure that program, uh, especially uh, building resi resiliency, but over, overall the professionalism. And North Carolina taking on three different countries on the continent. Uh, I, General Hokerson, I talked to him all the time, I just thanked him. Uh, that uh, that right there is impactful. It's in Southern Africa, you know, but for what they've already established uh, in their excellence in Botswana, uh, we're going to be witness to that because uh, I'm at the Chad conference uh, there uh, in a few months. But I'd just say I'd just say thank you to you uh, and uh, and and all the all the the members uh, uh, as part of the National Guard that are contributing their time to go into on the continent of Africa and contribute to three different countries. That means a lot, and we greatly appreciate the work of North Carolina's Guard and, and others. General Langley, the partnership with Morocco stands as a testament to a longstanding friendship rooted in shared security interests. Given this rich history and Morocco's strategic contributions, could you expand on how the collaboration exercises like African Line and Phoenix Express uh, fortifies regional security, and how does this um, cooperation influence U.S. AFRICOM's approach to emerging challenges in North Africa? Yes, uh, Morocco is uh, 
uh, one of our most closest non-NATO allies. Uh, moreover, they export security. Uh, they do it uh, by inviting to uh, uh, AFRICOM uh, and the other African countries uh, to be able to uh, put on a, uh, a multi uh, a multifaceted uh, air and land demonstration, but it's more than that. It builds interoperability of uh, various African uh, countries and builds co capacity. Uh, they are a microcosm of what we have, especially in also in their um, uh, their training and inst learning institutions. Uh, but they they, they affect uh, both uh, democratic norms and also core values, law of armed conflict, imparting that to our African uh, African partners on the continent. The Houthis and other Iranian proxies continue to wreak havoc in the Red Sea. We we're talking about that earlier, um, Dr. Wallander and General Corello. After President, uh, the president decided to label the Houthis as a special designated global terrorist group. What factors do you expect will play into the decision to redesignate them as a foreign terrorist organization? Thank you, Congressman. The, the, that was an important designation because it opened all kinds of options for sanctioning and limiting uh, the Houthis' access to resources and freedom of operation. Uh, the distinction uh, with foreign, we believe that that is sufficient to allow us to take proactive actions to constrain their capabilities without creating issues that uh, could have negative implications for the humanitarian situation in Yemen, which, as you know, has been really a matter of concern for many years. Jim. Yeah, I, d I defer really to the State Department. Um, it's a State Department designation. I think Dr. Wallander outlined the distinction really for the humanitarian concern. Okay. Well, thank you again um, for being with us today. Mr. Chair, with that, I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize this gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate everyone for being here today. I wanted to follow up on a couple of things, and I apologize if these have been uh, answered as I had to step out for another hearing. We talked about the increase, and we know that China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea has been geopolitically aligned for quite some time, and you talked about this renewed relationship, and I don't necessarily think that's, that's the proper phrase for it, maybe a strengthened relationship through uh, import exportation increases. Do you feel that uh, the, and to quote you, sanctioned oil exports that's going on between Iran to China has actually helped to strengthen the relationship in that geopolitical alliance? It has. And would you say that putting stronger sanctions, as we had in the previous administration, and redesignating the Houthi terrorists, which my colleague had just mentioned a second ago, would help to limit the Iranian proxy militias' uh, assets and resources? I think, Congressman, I think sanctions have to be imposed internationally, because Iran has become a master at how to evade uh, sanctions. And they're and they're actually passing on their best practices to Russia right now. Well, they're passing on their best practices to Russia, but China has been the greatest and the most nefarious when it comes to circumventing sanctions and not following them, and yet we still consider them to be, by some people's context, a competitor, when in reality they're actually an adversary. Um, and I think that we need to start recognizing that the evolution of warfare, and this is something that General Langley, I really applaud, because he's understood this and presented it very well, the idea in the evolution of warfare has gone well beyond the ideas of the first bullet that gets fired. We're now in warfare from a kinetic perspective. We've been in a cyber, a resource, a supply chain, and an economic and influence campaign by China for decades. There has been an ongoing Cold War that in many cases we've ignored through our failed foreign and domestic policies, which we all know is intrinsically linked. And we've allowed China to exploit Africa as a nation to where now they control 15 of 16 rare earth mineral mines. They continue to promise railways like they did between uh, Djibouti and other areas to try and link trade rails. They promise electrical terminal capabilities with 100-year uh, leases to try and create these reliances that has weakened America's ability to be able to compete with them in the non-kinetic influence capabilities. So my question is, is that for AFRICOM, what could we do to provide more resources and assets to help the fight and to be more effective in these non-kinetic elements of influence camp uh, campaigns for developing nations. Congressman, thanks for that question because uh, 
we know that we can't keep up with the Belt and Road Initiative, the billions of dollars in, in the infrastructure, but uh, what our partners are telling us, uh, don't force us to choose, but we still want you because of the value. Uh, the value of uh, your proposition and intrinsic value of what the US, United States offers holistically uh, is very compelling. Uh, so I'd say that uh, what we're seeing in Southern Africa, uh, we're seeing some uh, positivity as, as far as through uh, health diplomacy resonates, uh, and, and we need to tell that story better. I completely agree, and I would also say that speaking with other allies, you know, I, I sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee as well, the BRICS that has come out with Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and trying to invite also KSA into this, my understanding is, is that it's great in theory to try and in some way be a counter to the quad, but in reality, there is no actual economic or trade benefits to it whatsoever, so it's not worth the paper that's written on. So I think that we give it far more credence than it needs to. Uh, General Corella, I really want to talk to you about something when we talk about Tower 22. Look. Like yourself, I spent seven years in Iraq. I spent three years in Afghanistan, was in Kosovo during that wonderful campaign as well. Uh, been in Pakistan, Somalia, helped very uh, much with the 2016-17 push for Fallujah and Mosul from the private side uh, to help with ASV teams to retake. And we know about hardening structures. We've done indirect fire, cheap measures actually, with just simple four eye beams and a top. Knowing that Tower 22 had had an attack a year prior, knowing the geopolitical ramifications of where things were ramping up, understanding that Jordan, given the uh, October 7th incident and our increased attacks against Hamas and support of what's going on, how was it that Tower 22 still had no hardened structures? So, Congressman, the investigation is still ongoing. I'll be happy to provide that um, through OSD when it's done. What we did do is we moved as many um, T-walls across the AOR um, as we could. I think we put like 9,000 over the last year. I was at Tower 22 about two and a half weeks ago and looked at the physical um, construction uh, of the things there. I think one of the challenges, you had a counter UAS, um, you know, I'm having to balance where the greatest risks are um, for that. Uh, we did have one point. Gentleman's time's expired. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. General Angley, good to see you. You look like you're fit. You're ready to play rugby with us in uh, late July with the Marines, right? You definitely look ready. I know that we have a significant problem in AFRICOM, and, and uh, especially with the influence of Russia and China, probably exceeding our own over the uh, last couple decades, uh, watching them not only economically tie themselves and, and actually uh, exploit Africa. Uh, we have some major significant problems just because of the instability of the governments in those regions throughout the whole continent. What kind of assets do you think that you need? And, and certainly, what are your major challenges in a broad scale? I'm going I'm to allow you. We're going to talk about air defense at one time, but I think I really want you to kind of speak comprehensively to the needs that you need in Africa, which I think is maybe one of our most underrepresented uh, commands uh, of, of interest. Congressman, uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, and I'll, I'll address uh, China first. Uh, China's trying to replicate what we do that's working on the continent of Africa. Uh, and uh, I will just say they, they can't match what we're doing in uh, health diplomacy uh, in our efforts, uh, what USAID has been able to achieve in uh, malaria, AIDS, COVID, Ebola, and uh, also the full throws of uh, the PEPFAR program of increasing uh, life expectancy over 20%. China can't compete with that, so, but here's where they're trying to do it. They're trying to do it in their social economic coercion causes of a Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they also have some aspirations for uh, basing as well. It's, it's uh, a dual use uh, capacity. I'm concerned about that. But what we can uh, do is to double down on what we're doing, whole of government in the military sense, uh, where, we, where we have our SFAB, our Security Force Assistance Brigades building capacity, our state partnership program, our joint uh, combined and exchange uh, training that we're doing, that's unmatched. Uh, what China is trying to do is they're trying to offer more seats uh, and what we have our IMET, the International Military Education and Training, they're trying to match that. Uh, so I need more seats there. I need more joint exercise programs because China is trying to beat us. They're trying to displace. You mentioned humanitarian versus the exploitation of China and it, it keys me with a new, new question too. Uh, Obviously, if we're going to help somebody humanitarian-wise, everybody appreciates that, but we don't always get, I mean, since the, the book, The Ugly American, 
we, we don't get credit for what we give aid to because the governments control who gets credit. And unfortunately, the exploitation goes hand in hand with corrupt governments. And we know Africa has plenty of those to go around. My question is, when it comes to strategic uh, placing ourselves in a place where people recognize what our influence is and give credit to the United States, not in a selfish way, but in a way that is synergistic in our future, uh, how do we make sure that the people and the governments both recognize the United States as good players versus China and their nefarious methods of exploitation? Sure, within my command, I always talk to, um, you know, or, or whether it's the J3 or the J5, I said, we own the facts holistically in U.S. Gov, but we don't own the narrative. We own the facts. We don't own the narrative. We need to close that say do gap because we're doing some great things and we need to tell the, the story of our intrinsic value. Uh, we need to get better in our information operations. We need to be, get better at countering the disinformation operations, whether it's from uh, China or Russia, because there's a, a, a story to be told, uh, especially to our African uh, uh, partners, because it is compelling. Then this question is to both of you because it really concerns the Straits and, and the Houthis and what they're doing right now to disrupt us using Iranian technologies, Iranian drones. Uh, we've done nothing but facilitate them through the Biden policies of basically allowing them monies and, and the production, dissemination, and encouragement of bad guys to attack not only us but all of our allies. Uh, do you feel like you have the necessary tools to deal with that uh, in that region right now? Uh, Congressman, what we do need, we need more of a whole of government and international effort particularly on the deny line of effort, to deny Iran from providing those weapons in the first place. There's a UN uh, vessel inspection mechanism. Just like we did for counter piracy, we need to do for this counter smuggling effort. It's land and it's, uh, it's maritime. We need to isolate the Houthis in the information space. They say it's about Gaza. The Houthis have not provided one loaf of bread to Gaza. What they've actually done is delay it by making it go all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, increase the cost to it. So I find their righteous indignation a little bit laughable. Um, the other thing we need to do is impose cost on Iran, um, and that's a whole of government effort to be able, because they're the ones who are providing the weapons. From your mouth to God's ears, my time has expired. Thank you. And the chair now recognizes the final uh, member for the public segment of this hearing, Mr. Moylan for Guam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And although my, my focus of work on the committee has been for Indo-PACOM AOR, I do want to acknowledge the tremendous service uh, provided by the people of Guam throughout the global war on terror, which continues to this day. And currently, there are approximately 100 members of the Guam Army National Guard serving into the Middle East as part of Operation Spartan Shield. To these servicemen, I would like to say your island is proud and we await your safe return home. Uh, but I do have one question for you, for you General, General Carilla. So the recent Houthi attacks on shipping have forced the Fifth Fleet into fighting a campaign of contested logistics. So this is a problem set which the United States has not had to deal with in recent memory. In the future war, it's likely Guam will become reliant upon contested supply chains. Therefore, what lessons are you learning with specific reference to relevant insights for the Western Pacific? Great question, Congressman. I mean, I think we are learning a tremendous amount of lessons. And we're in the process of actually compiling a lot of them to share with all of our combatant command partners out there, particularly in the naval domain of what we're learning. Um, one thing we say is you can, you can shoot a, a destroyer and go empty in a matter of hours, but it takes weeks to resupply it. Um, we're learning about underway um, resupply. Um, one of the things you have to do is go to a port to resupply uh, the vertical launch tubes. Um, we need to get back to how can we do that at sea. There's a lot of other lessons that we've learned about the importance of also uh, resilient basing, access basing, and overflight are critical, and we'll share all those with our combatant commanders, fellas. Looking forward to it. I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony and your service to our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair now will recess this public portion of the hearing. We will reconvene in approximately five minutes in room 2212.